Good evening, and welcome to the International Shakespeare Players online presentation of Othello. I'll begin by reading Sonnet 125. Were it ought to me, I bore the canopy, with my extern the outward honoring, or laid great bases for eternity, which prove more short than waste or ruining. Have I not seen dwellers on form and favor lose all and more by paying too much rent for compound sweet foregoing simple savor, pitiful thrivers in their gazing spent? No, let me be obsequious in thy heart and take thou my oblation poor but free, which is not mixed with seconds, knows no art, but mutual render only me for thee. Hence, thou suborned informer, a true soul, when most impeached, impeached stands least in thy control. Act one, scene one, Venice, a street. Enter Rodrigo and Iago. Hush, never tell me I take it much unkindly that thou, Iago, would hast had my purse as if the strings were thine. Thou should know of this. Splod, but you will not hear me if ever I did dream of such a matter. Abhor me. Thou toldest that, thou toldest me thou that didst hold him in thy hate. Despise me if I do not. Three great ones of the city in personal suit to make me his lieutenant off cap to him. And by the faith of man, I know my price. I am worth no worse a place, but he, as loving his own pride and purposes, evades them with a bombast circumstance horribly stuffed with epithets of war, and in conclusion, non suits my mediators. For, certes, says he, I've already chose my officer. But what was he? Forsooth, a great arithmetician, one Michael Cassio of Florentine, a fellow almost damned in a fair wife, that never set a squadron in the field, nor the division of a battle knows more than a spinster unless the bookish rhetoric wherein the togged consuls can propose as masterly as he. Mere prattle without practice is all his soldiership. But he, sir, had the election. And I, of whom his eyes had seen the proof at Rhodes, at Cyprus, and on other grounds, Christian and heathen, must be believed and calmed by debitor and creditor. This countercaster, he in good time must his lieutenant be, and I, God, Bless the mark, his moorship's ancient. By heaven, I rather would have been his hangman. Why, there's no remedy. Tis the curse of service. Preferment goes by letter and affection, and not by old gradation, where each second stood heir to the first. Now, sir, be judge yourself, whether I in any just term am a fine to love the moor. I would not follow him then. Oh, sir, content you. I follow him to serve my turn upon him. We cannot all be masters, nor all masters cannot be truly followed. You shall mark many a duteous and knee-crooking knave that, doting on his own obsequious bondage, wears out his time, much like his master's ass, for naught but provender. And when he's old, cashiered. Whip me such honest knaves, others there are who, trimmed, in forms and visages of duty, keep yet their hearts attending on themselves, and throwing but shows of service on their lords, do well thrive by them, and when they have lined their coats, do themselves homage. These fellows have some soul, and such a one do I profess myself. For, sir, it is as sure as you are Roderigo, were I the more, I would not be Iago. In following him, I follow but myself. Heaven is my judge, not I for love and duty, but seeming so for my peculiar end. For when my outward action doth demonstrate the native act and figure of my heart and complement extern, it is not long after, but I will wear my heart upon my sleeve for daws to peck at. I am not what I am. What a fool fortune does, the thick lips owe, if he can't carry us thus. Call up her father, rouse him, make after him, poison his delight, proclaim him in the streets, incense her kinsman, and though he in a fertile climate dwell, plague him with flies. 
Though that his joy be joy, yet throw some changes of vexation on it, as it may lose some color. Here is her father's house. I'll call aloud. Do, with like timorous accent and dire yell, as when by night and negligence the fire is spied in populous cities. What? Ho! Oh. Brabantio! Signor Brabantio, ho! Oh. Awake! What? Ho, oh, Brabantio! Thieves, thieves! Thieves, look to your house, your daughter, and your bags. Thieves, thieves. Brabantio appears above at a window. What is the reason of this terrible summons? What is the matter there? Senor, is all your family within? Are your doors locked? Why, wherefore ask you this? Zoon, sir, you're robbed. For shame, put on your gown. Your heart is burst. You've lost half your soul. Even now, now, very now, an old black ram is tupping your white ewe. Rise, arise! Awake the snorting citizens with the bell, or else the devil may make a grandsire of you. Arise, I say. What? Have you lost your wits? Most reverend, re reverend senor, did... Do you know my voice? Not I. What are you? My name is Rodrigo. Oh, the worser the welcome. I have charged thee not to haunt about my doors. In honest plainness thou hast heard me say my daughter is not for thee. And now, in madness, being full of supper and distempering drafts, upon malicious bravery dost thou come to start my quiet! Sir, 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 I... But thou must needs be sure my spirit and my place have in them power to make this bitter to thee. Patience, good sir. What tellest thou of me of robbing? This is Venice. My house is not the Grange. Most grave Brabantio, in, in simple and pure soul, I come to you. Zoom, sir, you are one of those that will not serve God if the devil bid you. Because we come to do you service and you think we are ruffians, you'll have your daughter covered with a Barbary horse. You'll have your nephews neigh at you. You'll have coursers for cousins and genets for Germans. What profane wretch art thou? I am one, sir, that comes to tell you your daughter and the moor are now making the beast with two backs. Thou art a villain! You are a senator. This shout that thou answer, I know thee, Rodrigo. Sir, I, I will answer anything, but I, I beseech you, if it be your pleasure and most wise consent, as partly I find it is, that your fair daughter, at this odd even and dull watch of the night, transported with no worse, no better guard, but with a knave of common hire, a, a gondoler, to the gross collapses of lashvacious moor, if this be known to you and your allowance, we then have done you bold and saucy wrongs, but if you know not this, my manners tell me we have your wrong rebuke. Do not believe that from the sense of all civility I thus would play and trifle with your reverence, your daughter, if you have not given her leave. I say again, hath made a gross revolt, trying her duty, beauty, wit, and fortunes in an extravagance and wheeling stranger of here and everywhere. Straight satisfy yourself. If she be in her chamber or your house, let loose on me the justice of the state for thus deluding you. Strike of the tinder, ho! Give me a taper. Call upon my people. This accident is not unlike my dream. The leaf of it oppresses me already. Light, I say, light! Exit above. Farewell, for I must leave you. It seems not meet nor wholesome to my place to be produced, as if I stay I shall against the moor. For I do know the state, however this may gall him with some check, cannot with safety cast him. For he's embarked with such loud reason to the Cyprus wars, which even now stand in act, that for their souls another of his fathom they have none to lead their business. In which regard, though I do hate him, as I do hell pains, yet for necessity of present life, I must show out a flag and sign of love, which is indeed a sign, that you shall surely find him, lead to the Sagittary the raised search, and there will I be with him. So, farewell. Exit. Enter below Brabantio, servants with torches. It is too true and evil. Gone she is, and what's to come of my despised time is naught but bitterness. 
Now, Rodrigo, where dost thou see her? Oh, unhappy girl, with the more, sayest thou, would who would be a father? How dost thou know t'was she? Oh, she deceives me past thought. What said she to you? Get tapers, raised all my kindred. Are they married, thank you, thank you? Truly, I think they are. Oh, heaven, how got she out? Oh, treason of the blood, fathers, from hence trust not your daughters' minds, but what you see them act. Is there not charms by which the property of youth and maidhood may be abused? Have you not read, Rodrigo, of such thing? Yes, sir, I have indeed. Call, call up my brother. Oh, would you had had her. Some one way, some another. Do you know where you, we may apprehend her and the moor? I think I can discover him, if you please, to get a good guard and go along with me. Pray you lead on. At every house I'll call. I may command at most. Get weapons, ho! And raise some special officers of night. On, good Rodrigo, I'll deserve your pains. Exeunt. Act one, scene two, another street. Enter Othello, Iago, and attendants with torches. Though in the trade of war I have slain men, yet do I hold it very stuff of a conscience to do no contrivant murder. I lack iniquity sometimes to do me service. Nine or ten times I had thought to have yerked him here under the ribs. Tis better as it is. Nay, but he prated and spoke such scurvy and provoking terms against your honor that, with the little godliness I have, I did full hard forbear him. But I pray you, sir, are you fast married? Be assured of this, that the Magnifico is much beloved and hath in his effect a voice potential as double as the Duke's. He will divorce you, or put upon you what restraint and grievance the law with all his might to enforce it on will give him cable. Let him do his spite. My services which I have done the seigniory shall out-tongue his complaints. Tis yet to know, which when I know that boasting is an honor, I shall promulgate, I fetch my life and being from men of royal lineage and my demerits may speak unbonneted to as proud a fortune as this that I have reached. For no, Iago, but that I love the gentle Desdemona, I would not my unhoused free condition put into circumscription and confine for the sea's worth. But uh, look, what lights come yond? Those are the raised father and his friends. You were best go in. Not I. I must be found. My parts, my title, and my perfect self shall manifest me rightly. Is it they? By Janus, I think so. Enter Cassio and certain officers with torches. The servants of the Duke and my lieutenant. The goodness of the night upon you, friends. What is the news? The Duke does greet you, General, and he requires your haste post haste appearance, even on the instant. What is the matter, think you? Something from Cyphorus, as I may divine. It is a business of some heat. The galleys have sent a dozen sequent messengers this very night at one another's heels, and many of the consuls, raised and meet, are at the Duke's already. You have been hotly called for, when, being not at your lodging to be found, the Senate hath sent, sent about three several guests to search you out. Tis well I am found by you. I will but spend a word here in the house, and go with you. Exit. Ancient, what makes he here? Hey, he tonight hath boarded a land carrack. If it prove lawful prize, he's made forever. I do not understand. He's married. To who? Re-enter Othello. Mary to... Uh, come, Captain, will you go? Have with you. Here comes another troop to seek for you. It is Brabantio. General, be advised. He comes to bad intent. Enter Brabantio, Rodrigo, and officers with torches and weapons. Hola! Stand there! Senor, it is the Moor. Down with him, thief! They draw on both sides. You, Rodrigo, come, sir. I am for you. Keep up your bright swords, for the, the dew will rust them. Good senor, you shall command more with your years than with your weapons. 
Thou foul thief, where hast thou stowed my daughter? Damned as thou art, thou hast enchanted her. For I'll refer me to all things of sense. If she in chains of magic were not bound, whether a maid so tender, fair, and happy, so opposite to marriage that she shunned the wealthy curl darlings of our nation, would ever have to incur a general mock, run from her guardage to the sooty bosom of such a thing as thou, to fear not to delight. Judge me the world if tis not gross in sense that thou hast practiced on her with foul charms, abused her delicate youth with drugs or minerals that weaken motion. I'll have it disputed on. Tis probable and palpable to thinking. I therefore apprehend and do attach thee for an abuser of the world, a practicer of arts inhibited and out of warrant. Lay hold on him. If he do resist, subdue him at his peril. Hold your hands, both you of my inclining and the rest. Were it my cue to fight, I should have known it without a prompter. Where will you that I go to answer this your charge? To prison, till fit time of law and course of direct session call thee to answer. What if I do obey? How may the duke be therewith satisfied, whose messengers are here about my side? upon some present business of the state to bring me to him. Is true, most worthy signor, the duke's in council, and your noble self, I am sure, is sent for. How? Oh, the duke in council? Is this time of the night? Bring him away. Mine's not an idle cause. The duke himself or any of my brothers of the state cannot but feel this wrong as twere their own. For if such actions may have passage free, bond slaves and pagans shall our statesmen be. Exeunt. Act one, scene three, a council chamber. The duke and senators sitting at a table, officers attending. There is no composition in these news that gives them credit. Indeed, they are disproportioned. My letters say 107 galleys. And mine 140. And mine 200. But though they jump not on a just account, as in these cases wherein the aim reports, tis oft with difference. Yet do they call, yet do they all confirm a Turkish fleet and bearing up to Cyprus. Nay, it is possible enough to judgment. I do not so secure me in the error, but the main article I do approve in fearful sense. Within. What ho? What ho? What ho? A messenger from the galleys. Enter a sailor. Now, what's the business? The Turkish preparation makes for roads. So was I bid report here to the state by Signor Angelo. <laughs> I'll say you by this change. This cannot be, by no assay of reason, tis a pageant to keep us in false gaze. When we consider the importance of Cyprus to the Turk, and let ourselves again but understand that as it more concerns the Turk than Rhodes, so may he with more facile question bear it. For that it stands not in such warlike brace, but altogether lacks the abilities that Rhodes is dressed in. If we make thought of this, we must not think the Turk is so unskillful to leave that latest which concerns him first, neglecting an attempt of ease and gain to wake and wage a, a danger profitless. Nay, in all confidence, he's not for Rhodes. Here is more news. Enter messenger. The Ottomites, reverend and gracious, steering with due course towards the Isle of Rhodes, have there jointed them with an after fleet. Aye, so I thought. How many, as you guess? Of thirty sail, and now they do restem their backward course, bearing with frank appearance their purposes toward Cyprus, Signor Montano, your trusty and most valiant servitor, with his free duty recommends you thus, and prays you to believe him. To certain then for Cyprus. Marcus Lucicios, is he not in town? He's now in Florence. A write from us to him. Post, post haste dispatch. Here comes Brabantio and the valiant Moor. Enter Brabantio, Othello, Iago, Rodrigo, and officers. 
Valiant Othello, we must straight employ you against the general enemy Ottoman. To Brabantio. I, I did not see you. A welcome, gentle senor. We lacked your counsel and your help tonight. So did I yours. Uh, good your grace, pardon me. Neither my place nor aught I heard of business hath raised me from my bed, nor doth the general care take hold on me, for my particular grief is of so floodgate and o'erbearing nature that it gluts and swallows other sorrows, and it is still itself. What, why? What's the matter? My daughter. Oh, my daughter! With Senator. Dead? Uh, I... To, to me, she, she is abused, stolen from me, and corrupted by spells and medicines bought of mountebanks for nature so preposterously to err, being not deficient, blind, or lame of sense, sans witchcraft could not. Where he be, that in this foul proceeding has thus beguiled your daughter of herself and you of her, the bloody book of law you shall yourself read in the bitter letter after your own sense, yea, though our proper son stood in your action. Humbly I thank your grace. Here is the man, this Moor, whom now it seems your special mandate for the state's affairs hath hither brought. With Senator. We are very sorry for it. To Othello. What in your own part can you say to this? Nothing, but this is so. Most potent, grave, and reverend seniors, my very noble and approved good masters, that I have ta'en away this old man's daughter. It is most true. True, I have married her. The very head and front of my offending hath this extent no more. Rude am I in my speech, and little blessed with the soft phrase of peace. For since these arms of mine had seven years' as pith, till now some nine moons wasted, they have used their dearest action in the tented field. And little of this great world can I speak, more than pertains to feats of broil and battle, and therefore little shall I grace my cause in speaking for myself. Yet, by your gracious patience, I will a round, unvarnished tale deliver of my whole course of love. What drugs, what charms, what conjuration, and what mighty magic for such proceeding I am charged with, I won his daughter. A maiden never bold, of spirit so still and quiet that her motion blushed at herself. And she, in spite of nature, of years, of country, credit, everything, to fall in love with what she feared to look on. It is a judgment maimed and most imperfect that will confess perfection so could err against all rules of nature and must be driven to find out practices of cunning hell why this should be. I therefore vouch again that with some mixtures powerful or the blood or with some dram conjured to this effect, he wrought upon her. To vouch this is no proof without more wider and more overt test than these thin habits and poor likelihoods of modern seeming to prefer against him. But Othello speak, did you by indirect and forced courses subdue and poison this young maid's affections? Or came it by request in such fair question as soul to soul affordeth? I do beseech you, send for the lady to the Sagittary and let her speak for me before her father. If you do find me foul in her report, the trust, the office I do hold of you, not only take away, but let your sentence even fall upon my life. Fetch Desdemona hither. Ancient, conduct them. You best know the place. Exit, Iago in attendance. And till she come, as truly as to heaven, I do confess the vices of my blood. So justify to your grave ears, I'll present how I did thrive in this fair lady's love, and she in mine. Say it, Othello. Her father loved me, oft invited me, still questioned me the story of my life. From year to year, the battles, sieges, fortunes that I have passed, 
I ran it through, even from my boyish days, to the very moment that he bade me tell it, wherein I spake of most disastrous chances, of moving accidents by flood and field, of hair-breath escapes in the imminent deadly breach, of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery, of my redemption thence and my portents in my travel's history, wherein of antres vast and deserts idle, rough quarries, rocks and hills, whose heads touch heaven, it was my hint to speak. Such was the process, and of the cannibals that each, each other, the anthropomagi and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders, this to hear would Desdemona seriously incline. But still, the house affairs would draw her thence, which ever as she could with haste dispatch, she'd come again and with greedy ear devour up my discourse, which I observing took once a client hour and found good means to draw from her a prayer of earnest heart that I would all my pilgrimage dilate whereof my parcels she had something heard, but not inventively, intentionally, I did consent, and often did beguile her of her tears, when I did speak of some distressful stroke that my youth suffered. My story being done, she gave me for my pains a world of sighs. She swore in faith, twas strange, Twas passing strange, twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. She wished she had not heard it, yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. She thanked me and bade me if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story. And that would woo her. Upon this hint, I spake and she loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. This only is the witchcraft I have used. Here comes the lady, let her witness it. Enter Desdemona, Iago, and attendants. I think this tale would win my daughter too. Good Barontio, take up this mangled matter at the best. Men do their broken weapons rather use than their bare hands. I pray you hear her speak. If she confess that she was half the wooer, destruction on my head, if my bad blame light on the man. Come hither, gentle mistress. Do you perceive in all this noble company where most you owe obedience? My noble father, I do perceive here a divided duty. To you, I am bound for life and education. My life and education both do learn me how to respect you. You are the Lord of duty. I am hitherto your daughter, but here's my husband and so much duty as my mother showed to you, preferring you before her father, so much I challenge that I may profess due to the more my Lord. God be with you. I have done. Please at your grace on to the state affairs. I had rather to adopt a child than get it. Come hither more. I here do give thee that with all my heart, which but thou hast already with all my heart, I would keep from thee for your sake, Jewel. I am glad at soul I have no other child, for thy escape would teach me tyranny to hang clogs on them. I have done, my lord. Let me speak like yourself and lay a sentence which as agrees or step may help these lovers into your favor. When remedies are past, the griefs are ended by seeing the worst which late on hopes depended. To mourn a mischief that has passed and gone is the next way to draw new mischief on. What cannot be preserved when fortune takes patience, her injury a mockery makes. The robbed that smiles steals something from the thief. He robs himself that spends a bootless grief. So let the Turk of Cyprus us beguile. We lose it not so long as we can smile. He bears the sentence well that nothing bears but the free comfort which 
from thence he hears, but he bears both the sentence and the sorrow, that, to pay grief, must of poor patience borrow. These sentences to sugar or to gall, both uh, being strong on both sides, are equivocal, but words are words. I never yet did hear that the bruised heart was pierced through the ear. I humbly beseech you, proceed to the affairs of state. The Turk with the most mighty preparation makes for Cyprus. Othello, the fortitude of the place is best known to you, and though we have there a substitute of most allowed sufficiency, yet opinion, a sovereign mistress of effects, throws a more safer voice on you. You must therefore be content to slubber the gloss of your new fortunes with this more stubborn and boisterous expedition. Tyrant custom, most grave senators, hath made the flinty and steel couch of war my thrice-driven bed of down. I do agonize a natural and prompt alacrity I find in hardness, and do undertake these present wars against the Automites. Most humbly, therefore, bending to your state, I crave fit disposition for my wife. Do you reference a place and exhibition with such accommodation and besort as levels with her breeding? That if you please, be it at her father's. I'll not have it so. Nor I. Nor I. I would not there reside to put my father in impatient thoughts by being in his eye. Most gracious Duke, to my unfolding, lend your prosperous ear, and let me find a charter in your voice to assist my simpleness. What would you, Desdemona? That I did love the more to live with him. My downright violence and storm of fortunes may trumpet to the world. My heart's subdued even to the very quality of my lord. I saw Othello's visage in his mind, and to his honor and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate. So that, dear lords, if I be left behind, a moth of peace, and he go to the war, the rights for which I love him are bereft me and I a heavy interim shall support by his dear absence. Let me go with him. Let her have your voices. Vouch with me, heaven, I therefore beg it not to please the palate of my appetite, nor to comply with heat the young effects in my defunct and proper satisfaction, but to be free and bounteous to her mind. And heaven defend your good souls that you think I will your serious and great business scant, for she is with me. No. When light winged toys of feathered Cupid seal with wanton dullness my speculative and office instruments, that my disports corrupt and taint my business, let housewives make a skillet of my helm, and all indignity and base adversaries make head against my estimation. Be it as you shall privately determine, either for her stay or going, the affair cries haste, and speed must answer it. You must away tonight. With all my heart. At nine in the morning, here we'll meet again. Othello, leave some officer behind, and he shall our commission bring to you with such things else of quality and respect as doth import you. So please, your grace, my ancient, a man he is, honest and trust, to his conveyance I assign my wife, and with what else needful your good grace shall think to be sent after me. Let it be so. Good night to everyone. To Babatio. And, noble senor, if virtue no delighted beauty lack, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. Adiel brave Moore, use Desdemona well. Look to her, Moore. If thou hast eyes to see, she has deceived her father and may thee. Exeunt Duke of Venice, senators, officers. My life upon her faith. Honest Iago, my Desdemona must I leave to thee. I prithee, let thy wife attend on her, and bring them after in the best advantage. Come, Desdemona, I have but an hour of love, of worldly matters and direction to spend with thee. We must obey the time. Exeunt Othello and Desdemona. Iaco. What sayest thou, noble heart? 
What will I do, thinkest thou? Why well, go to bed and sleep? I will incontently drown myself. If thou dost, I shall never love thee after. Why, thou silly gentleman? Is it silliness to live when to live is torment and to have we a prescription to die when death is our physician? Oh, villainous! I have looked upon the world for four times seven years, and since I could distinguish betwixt a benefit and an injury, I never found man that knew how to love himself. Ere I would say I would drown myself for the love of a guinea hen, I would change my humanity with a baboon. What should I do? I confess it is my shame to be so fond but it is not in my virtue to amend it. Virtue? A fig. Tis in ourselves that we are thus or thus. Our bodies are our gardens, to the which our wills are gardeners, so that if we will plant nettles or sow lettuce, set hyssop and weed up thyme, supply it with one gender of herbs or distract it with many, either to have it sterile with idleness or manured with industry. Why, the power and corrigible authority of this lies in our wills. If the balance of our lives had not one scale of reason to poise another of sensuality, the blood and baseness of our natures would conduct us to most preposterous conclusions. But we have reason, to cool our raging motions, our carnal stings, our unbitted lusts, whereof I take this that you call love to be a sect or scion. It, it cannot be. It is merely a lust of the blood and a permission of the will. Come, be a man. Drown thyself, drown cats and blind puppies. I have professed me thy friend, and I confess me knit to thy deserving with cables of perdurable toughness. I could never better steed thee than now. Put money in thy purse. Follow thou the wars. Defeat thy favor with an usurped beard. I say, put money in thy purse. It cannot be that Desdemona should long continue her love to the moor, put money in thy purse, nor he his will to her. It was a violent commencement, and thou shalt see an answerable sequestration, but put money in thy purse. These moors are changeable in their wills. Fill thy purse with money. The food that to him now is as luscious as locusts shall be to him shortly as bitter as colon quintida. She must change for youth. When she is sated with his body, she will find the error of her choice. She must have change. She must. Therefore, put money in thy purse. If thou wilt needs damn thyself, do it a more delicate way than drowning. Make all the money thou canst. If sanctimony and a frail vow betwixt an erring barbarian and a super subtle Venetian not too hard for my wits and all the tribe of hell, thou shalt enjoy her. Therefore, make money. A pox of drowning thyself, it is clean out of the way. Seek thou rather to be hanged, encompassing thy joy, than to be drowned and go without her. Will thou be fast to my hopes, if I depend the issue? Thou art sure of me. Go, make money. I have told thee often, and I retell thee again and again, I hate the more. My cause is hearted, thine hath no less reason. Let us be conjunctive in our revenge against him. If thou canst cuckold him, thou dost thyself a pleasure, me a sport. There are many events in the womb of time which will be delivered. Traverse, go, provide thy money. We will have more of this tomorrow. Adieu. Where shall we meet in the morning? At my lodging. We'll be there with the, the times. Go to. Farewell. Do you hear, Rodrigo? What say you? No more of drowning, do you hear? I am changed. I'll go sell all my land. Exit. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. For I, mine own gained knowledge, should profane if I would time expend with such a snipe, but for my sport 
and profit. I hate the moor, and it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he has done my office. I know not if it be true, but I, for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if for surety. He holds me well, the better shall my purpose work on him. Cassio's a proper man. Let me see now. To get his place and to plume up my will in double knavery. How, how, let's see. After some time to abuse a fellow's ear that he is too familiar with his wife. He hath a person and a smooth disposed to be suspected, framed to make women false. The moor is of a free and open nature that thinks men honest that but seem to be so, and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. I have it. It is engendered. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. Exit. Act two, scene one. A seaport in Cyprus, an open place near the quay. Enter Montano and two gentlemen. What from the Cape can you discern at sea? Nothing at all. It is a high route flood. I cannot twixt the heaven and the main descry a sail. Methinks the wind hath spoke aloud at land. A fuller blast ne'er shook our battlements. If it hath ruffians so upon the sea, what ribs of oak when mountains melt on them can hold the mortise? What shall we hear of this? The segregation of the Turkish fleet. For do but stand upon the foaming shore, the children below seems to pelt the clouds. The wind-shaked surge with high and monstrous mane seems to cast water on the burning bear and quench the guards of the ever-fixed pole. I never did like molestation view on the enchafed flood. If that the Turkish fleet be not in sheltered and embayed, they are drowned. It is impossible they bear it out. Enter a third gentleman. News, lads, our wars are done. The desperate tempest hath so banged the Turks that their designment halts. A noble ship of Venice hath seen a grievous wreck and sufferance on most part of their fleet. How, is this true? The ship is here put in, a Veronisa. Michael Cassio, lieutenant to the warlike Moor Othello, is come on shore, the Moor himself at sea, and is in full commission here for Cyprus. I am glad on't, tis a worthy governor. But this same Cassio, though he speak of comfort, touching the Turkish loss, yet he looks sadly and prays the Moor be safe, for they were parted with foul and violent tempests. Pray heavens he be. For I have served him, and the man commands like a full soldier. Let's to the seaside, ho, and as well to see the vessel that's come in as to throw out our eyes for brave Othello, even till we make the main and the aerial blue in indistinct regard. Come, let's do so, for every minute is expectancy of more arrivants. Enter Cassio. Thanks you, the, valli the valiant of this warlike isle that so approve the more. Oh, let the heavens give him defense against the elements, for I have lost us him on a dangerous sea. Is he well shipped? His bark is stoutly timbered, his pilot of very expert and approved allowance. Therefore, my hopes, not sure fitted to death, stand in bold cure. A cry within, a sail, a sail, a sail. Enter a fourth gentleman. What noise? Town is empty. On the brow of the sea stand ranks of people, and they cry, a sail. My hopes do shape him for the governor. Guns heard. They do discharge their shot of courtesy, our friends at least. I pray you, sir, go forth and give us truth who tis that is arrived. I shall exit. But, good lieutenant, is your general arrived? Most fortunately, he hath achieved a maid that paragon's description and wild fame. One that excels the quirks of blazoning pens and in the essential vesture of creation does tire the engineer. Re-enter the second gentleman. How now? Who has put in? Tis Juan Iago, ancient to the general. Has had most favor favorable and happy speed. Tempests Tempests themselves, high seas and howling winds, the guttered rocks and congregated sands, 
traitors and steeped to clog the guiltless keel as having sense of beauty do omit their mortal natures left letting go safely by the divine desdemona but what is she she that i spake of our great captain's captain left in the conduct of the bold iago whose footing here anticipates our thoughts a signet's speed great jove a fellow guard and swell his sail with thine own powerful breath that he may bless this bay with his tall ship make love's quick pants into desdemona's arms give renewed fire to our excited spirits and bring all Cyprus comfort. Enter Desdemona, Emilia, Iago, Rodrigo, and attendants. Uh, behold, the riches of the ship is come on shore. Ye men of Cyprus, let her have your knees. Hail to thee, lady, and the grace of heaven before, behind thee, and on every hand in wheel thee round. I thank you, valiant Cassio. What tidings can you tell me of my lord? He is not yet arrived, nor I know aught, but that he's well and will be shortly here. Oh, but I fear. How lost you company? The great contention of the sea and skies parted our fellowship. But hark, a sail! Within, a sail, a sail, guns heard. They give their greeting to the citadel, this likewise is a friend. See for the news. Exit, gentlemen. Good ancient, you are welcome. To Amelia. Welcome, mistress. Let, let it not gall your patience, good Iago, that I extend my manners. Tis my breeding that gives me this bold show of courtesy. Kissing her. Sir, would she give you so much of her lips as of her tongue she oft bestows on me? You'll have enough. Alas, she has no speech. In faith, too much. I find it still when I have list to sleep. Mary, before your ladyship, I grant she puts her tongue a little in her heart and chides with thinking. You have little cause to say so. Come on, come on. You are pictures out of doors, bells in your parlors, wild cats in your kitchen, saints in your injuries, devils being offended, players in your housewifery, and housewives in your beds. <laughs> Fie upon thee, slanderer. Nay, it is true, or else I am a Turk. You rise to play and go to bed to work. You shall not write my praise. No, let me not. <sighs> what wouldst thou write of me, if thou shouldst praise me? Oh, gentle lady, do not put me to it, for I am nothing if not critical. Come on, I say. There's one gone to the harbor. Aye, madam. I am not merry, but I do beguile the thing I am by seeming otherwise. Come, how wouldst thou praise me? I am about it, but indeed my invention comes from my pate as bird lime does from freeze. It plucks out brains and all, but my muse labors, and thus she is delivered. If she be fair and wise, fairness and wit, the one's for use, the other useth it. Well praised. How if she be black and witty? If she be black and there to have a wit, she'll find a white that shall her blackness fit. <laughs> worse and worse. How if fair and foolish? She never yet was foolish that was fair, for even her folly helped her to an heir. <laughs> These are old fond paradoxes to make fools laugh in the alehouse. What miserable praise hast thou for her that's foul and foolish? There's none so foul and foolish thereunto, but does foul pranks which fair and wise ones do. Oh, heavy ignorance! Thou praisest the worst best! But what praise couldst thou bestow on a deserving woman indeed, one that, in the authority of her merit, did justly put on the vouch of very malice itself? She that was ever fair and never proud, had tongue at will and yet was never loud, never lacked gold and yet went never gay, fled from her wish, and yet said, now I may. She that being angered, her revenge being nigh, bade her wrong stay and her displeasure fly. She that in wisdom never was so frail to change the cod's head for the salmon's tail. She that could think and ne'er disclose her mind, see suitors following and not look behind. She was a white, if ever such white were. To do what? 
to Suckle Fools and Chronicle Small Beer. <laughs> Lame and impotent conclusion. Do not learn of him, Amelia, though he be thy husband. How say you, Cassio? Is he not a most profane and liberal counselor? He speaks home, madam. You may relish him more in the soldier than in the scholar. Aside. He takes her by the palm. Ah, well said, whisper. With as little a web as this will I ensnare as great a fly as Cassio. Oh, smile upon her, do. I will give thee in thine own courtship. You say true, tis so indeed. If such tricks as these strip you out of your lieutenantry, it had been better you had not kissed your three fingers so oft, which now again you are most apt to play the sir in. Oh, very good, well kissed, an excellent courtesy. Tis so indeed, yet again your fingers to your lips. Would they were clister pipes for your sake. Trumpet within. The more I know his trumpet. Tis truly so. Let's meet him and receive him. Lo, where he comes. Enter Othello and attendants. Oh, my fair warrior. <laughs> my dear Othello. It gives me wonder, great is my content, to see you here before me. Oh, my soul's joy. If after every tempest comes such calms, may the winds blow till they have wakened death and let the laboring bark climb hills of seas, Olympus high, and duck again as low as hells from heaven. If it were now to die, as twere now to be most happy, for I fear my soul hath her content so absolute that not another comfort like to this succeeds in unknown fate. The heavens forbid, but that our loves and comforts should increase, even as our days do grow. Amen to that, sweet powers. I cannot speak enough of this content. It stops me here. It is too much of joy. And this, and this, the greatest discord be. Kissing her. That e'er our hearts shall make. Aside. Oh, you are well tuned now. But I'll set down the pegs that make this music as honest as I am. Come, let's to the castle. News, friends, our wars are done. The Turks are drowned. <laughs> How does my old acquaintance of this isle? Honey, you shall be well desired in Cyprus. I have found great love amongst them. Oh, my sweet, I prattle out of fashion and I dote in mine own comforts. I prithee, good Iago, go to the bay and disembark my coffers. Bring thou the master to the citadel. He is a good one and his worthiness does challenge much respect. Come, Desdemona, once more, well met at Cyprus. Exeunt Othello, Desdemona, and attendants. Do thou meet me presently at the harbor. Come hither. If thou beest valiant, as they say, base men being in love, have them a nobility in their natures more than is native to them, list me. The lieutenant tonight watches on the court of guard. First, I must tell thee this. Desdemona is directly in love with him. With him? But it is not possible. Shh. Lay thy finger thus, and let thy soul be instructed. Mark me with what violence she first loved the more, but for bragging and telling her fantastical lies, and will she love him still for prating? Let not thy discreet heart think it. Her eye must be fed, and what delight shall she have to look on the devil? When the blood is made dull with the act of sport, there should be again to inflame it and to give satiety a fresh appetite, loveliness and favor, sympathy in years, manners and beauties, all which the moor is defective in. Now, for want of these required conveniences, her delicate tenderness will find itself abused, begin to heave the gorge, disrelish and abhor the moor very nature will instruct her in it and compel her to some second choice. Now, sir, this granted, as it is a most pregnant and unforced position, who stands so imminent in the degree of this fortune as Cassio does? A knave, 
very voluble, no further conscionable than in putting on the mere form of civil and humane seeming for the better compassing of his salt and most hidden loose affection? Why none, why none? A slipper and subtle knave, a finder of occasions that has an eye can stamp and counterfeit advantages, though true advantages never present itself. A devilish knave. Besides, the knave is handsome, young, and hath all those requisites in him that folly and green minds look after. A pestilent, complete knave. And the woman hath found him already. I cannot believe that in her. She's full of most blessed condition. <laughs> blessed fig's end. The wine she drinks is made of grapes. If she had been blessed, she would never have loved the more. Bless pudding. Didst thou not see her paddle with the palm of his hand? Didst not mark that. Yes. Yes, that I did. But, but that was but courtesy. Lechery by this hand. An index and obscure prologue to the history of lust and foul thoughts. They met so near with their lips that their breaths embraced together. Villainous thoughts, Roderigo. When these mutualities so marshal the way, hard at hand comes the master and main exercise, the incorporate conclusion. But, sir, be you ruled by me. I have brought you from Venice. Watch you tonight for the command. I'll lay it upon you. Cassio knows you not. I'll not be far from you. Do you find some occasion to anger Cassio, either by speaking too loud or tainting his discipline or from what other course you please, which the time shall more favorably minister? Well, sir, he is rash and very sudden in choler and happily may strike at you. Provoke him that he may, for even out of that will I cause these of Cyprus to mute me whose qualification shall come into no true taste again, but by the displanting of Cassio. So y shall you have a shorter journey to your desires by the means I shall then have to prefer them? And the impediment most profitably removed without the which there were no expectation of our prosperity. I will do this. If I can bring it any opportunity. I warrant thee, meet me by and by at the Citadel. I must fetch his necessaries ashore. Farewell. Adieu. Exit. That Cassio loves her, I do well believe it. That she loves him, tis apt and of great credit. The more, howbeit that I endure him not, is of a constant, loving, noble nature. And I dare think he'll prove to Desdemona a most dear husband. Now, I do love her too. Not out of absolute lust, though peradventure I stand accountant for as great a sin, but partly led to diet my revenge, for that I do suspect the lusty moor hath leaped into my seat. The thought whereof doth like a poisonous mineral gnaw my inwards, and nothing can or shall content my soul till I am evened with him, wife for wife, or failing so. Yet that I put the moor at least into a jealousy so strong that judgment cannot cure. Which thing to do if this poor trash of Venice, whom I trash for his quick hunting, stand the putting on, I'll have our Michael Cassio on the hip, abuse him to the moor in the rank garb, for I fear Cassio with my nightcap too. Make the moor thank me, love me, and reward me for making him egregiously an ass and practicing upon his peace and quiet, even to madness. Tis here, but yet confused. Knavery's plain face is never seen till used. Exit. Act two, scene two, a street. Enter a herald with a proclamation, people following. It is Othello's pleasure, our noble and valiant general, that upon certain tidings now arrived, importing the mere perdition of the Turkish fleet, every man put himself into triumph, some to dance, some to make bonfires, each man to do what sport 
and revels his addiction leads him. For besides these beneficial news, it is the celebration of his nuptial. So much was his pleasure should be proclaimed. All offices are open, and there is full liberty of feasting from this present hour of five till the bell have tolled eleven. Heaven bless the Isle of Cyprus and our noble general Othello. Exeunt. Act two, scene three, a hall in the castle. Enter Othello, Desdemona, Cassio, and attendants. Good Michael Cassio, uh, look you to the guard tonight. Let's teach ourselves that honorable stop, not to outsport discretion. Iago hath direction what to do, but notwithstanding without my personal eye, will I look to it. Iago is most honest. Michael, good night. Tomorrow at your earliest, let me have speech with you. To Desdemona. Come, my dear love. The purchase made, the fruits are to ensue. That profits yet to come between me and you. Excellent, Oth Excellent Othello, Desdemona, and attendants enter Iago. Welcome, Iago. We must to the watch. Not this hour, Lieutenant. Tis not yet ten of the clock. Our general cast us thus early for the love of his Desdemona, who let us not therefore blame. He hath not yet made want in the night with her. And she is sport for Joe. She is a most exquisite lady. Mm, and I'll warrant her. Fun of game. Indeed, she, she's a most fresh and delicate creature. What an eye she has. Methinks it sounds a parley of provocation. An inviting eye, and yet methinks right modest. And when she speaks, is it not an alarum to love? She is indeed perfection. Oh, well, happiness to their sheets. Come, Lieutenant, I have a stoop of wine, and here without are a brace of Cyprus gallants that would fain have a measure to the health of black Othello. Not tonight, good Iago. I have very poor and unhappy brains for drinking. I could well wish courtesy would invent, would invent some other custom of entertainment. Oh, they are our friends. But one cup, I'll drink for you. I have drunk but one cup tonight, and that <laughs> will craftily qualify too, and behold, what innovation it makes here. I am unfortunate in the in infirmity and dare not task my weakness with any more. What, man, tis a night of revels. The gallants desire it. Where are they? Here at the door. I pray you, call them in. I'll do it, but it dislikes me. Exit. I can fasten but one cup upon him. With that which he hath drunk tonight already, he'll be as full of quarrel and offense as my young mistress dog. Now, my sick fool, Rodrigo, whom love hath turned almost the wrong side out, to Desdemona hath tonight caroused potations bottle deep. And he's to watch three lads of Cyprus, noble swelling spirits that hold their honors in a wary distance. The very elements of this warlike isle have I tonight flustered with flowing cups. And they watch too. Now, amongst this flock of drunkards, am I to put our Cassio in some action that may offend the isle? But here they come. If consequence do but approve my dream, my boat sails freely, both with wind and steam. Re-enter Cassio, with him Montano and gentlemen, servants following with wine. For oh God, they have given me a rouse already. Good faith, a little one, not past a pint, as I am a soldier. Some wine, ho! <laughs> and let me the canakin clink, clink, and let me the canakin clink. A soldier's a man, a life's but a span. Why then let a soldier drink? Some wine, boys. For God, an excellent song. I learned it in England, where indeed they are most potent in potting. Your Dane, your German, and your swag-bellied Hollander drink, ho, are nothing to your English. Is your Englishman so expert in his drinking? Why, he drinks you with facility. 
Your Dane dead drunk. He swears not to overthrow your Almain. He gives your Hollander a vomit. There the next puddle can be filled. To the health of our general. I am Ford Lieutenant, and I'll do you justice. Oh, sweet England. King Stephen was a worthy peer. His breeches cost him but a crown. He held them sixpence all to dear. With that, he called the tailor down. He was a wight of high renown, and thou art but of low degree. Tis pride that pulls the country down. Then take thine old cloak about thee. Some wine, ho! Why, this is a more exquisite song than the other. Will you hear it again? No, no, for I hold him to be unworthy of his place that does those things. Well, God's above all, and there be souls must be saved, and there be souls Tis, must die. Tis true, good lieutenant. For mine own part, no offense to the general, nor any man of quality, I hope to be saved. And so do I too, lieutenant. Aye, but by your leave, not before me, the lieutenant is to be saved before the ancient. Let's have some more of this. Let's to our affairs. Uh, forgive us our sins, gentlemen. Let's look to our business. Do not think, gentlemen, I am drunk. This is, this is my ancient. This, this is my right hand. This is my left hand. I am not drunk now. I can, I can stand well enough. I can speak, I can speak well enough. Oh, excellent, well. <laughs> Why? Very well, then you must not think then that I am drunk. Exit. <laughs> to the platform masters, come, let's set the watch. You see this fellow that has gone before. Mm. He is a soldier fit to stand by Caesar and give direction and do but see his vice. Tis to his virtue a just equinox, the one as long as the other. It is pity of him. I fear the trust Othello puts in him on some odd time of his infirmity, will shake this island. Oh, but is he often thus? Tis evermore the prologue to his sleep. He'll watch the horologue a double set if drink rock not his cradle. For well, the general will put in mind of it. Perhaps he sees it not, or his good nature prizes the virtue that appears in Cassio and looks not on his evils. Is not this true? Enter Rodrigo, aside to him. Oh, now, Rodrigo, I pray you after the lieutenant. Go! Exit, Rodrigo. And tis great pity that the noble Moor should hazard such a place as his own second with one of an engraft infirmity. It were an honest action to say so to the Moor. Not I for this fair island. Yes. I do love Cassio well, and would do much to cure him of this evil. But hark, what noise? Cry within, help, help, re-enter Cassio, driving in Rodrigo. You rogue, you <laughs> rascal. What's the matter, Lieutenant? A knave, teach me my duty. I'll beat the knave into a twig and bottle. <laughs> come, come, beat me. Dost thou prat, rogue? Striking Rodrigo. Nay, good lieutenant, Stand I pray him. you, sir, hold your hand. Let me go, sir, or I'll knock you o'er the mazard. Come, come, you're drunk. Drunk! They fight. Aside to Rodrigo. Away, I say, go out and cry a mutiny. Exit, Rodrigo. Nay, good lieutenant, alas, gentlemen, help. Ho, oh, lieutenant, sir, Montano, sir, help, masters. Here's a goodly watch indeed. Bell rings. Who's that which rings the bell, Diablo, ho! The town will rise, God's will, Lieutenant, hold! You will be shamed forever! Re-enter Othello in attendance. What is the matter here? <sighs> Soons, I bleed still. I am hurt to the death. Hold for your lives. Hold, ho! Lieutenant, sir, Montano, gentlemen, have you forgot our sense of place and duty? Hold! The general speaks to you. Hold! Hold for shame. Why, how now? Ho! From whence ariseth this? Are we turned Turks, and to ourselves do that which heaven hath forbid the Ottomites? For Christian shame, put by this barbarous brawl, he that stirs 
his neck to carve for his own rage, holds his soul light. He dies upon his motion. Silence that dreadful bell. It frights the isle from her propriety. What is the matter, masters? Honest Iago, that looks dead with grieving, speak. Who began this? On thy love, I charge thee. I do not know. Friends, all but now, even now, in quarter and in terms like bride and groom, divesting them for bed, and then, but now, as if some planet had unwitted men, swords out and tilting one at other's breast in opposition bloody. I cannot speak any beginning to this peevish odds, and would in action glorious I had lost those legs that brought me to a part of it. How comes it, Michael, you are thus forgot? I pray you pardon me. I cannot speak. Worthy Montano, you were wont to be civil. The gravity and stillness of your youth the world hath noted, and your name is great in mouths of wisest censure. What's the matter that you unlace your reputation thus and spend your rich opinion for the name of a night brawler? Give me answer to it. Worthy a fellow, I am hurt to danger. Your officer, Iago, can inform you. <clears throat> While I spare speech, which something now offends me, of all that I do know, nor know I aught by me that said or done amiss this night, unless self-charity be sometimes a vice, and to defend ourselves it be a sin when violence assails us. Now, by heaven, my blood begins my safer guides to rule. And passion, having my best judgment collied, assays to lead the way. If I once stir, or do but lift this arm, the best of you shall sink in my rebuke. Give me to know how this foul rout began, who set it on, and he that is approved in this offense, though he had twinned with me, both at a birth shall lose me. What? In a town of war, yet wild, the people's hearts brimful of fear, to manage private and domestic quarrel in night and on the court and guard of safety. Tis monstrous. Iago, who began to? If partially affined or leagued in office, thou dost deliver more or less than truth, thou art no soldier. Touch me not so near. I had rather have this tongue cut from my mouth than it should do offense to Michael Cassio. Yet I do persuade myself to speak the truth shall nothing wrong him. Thus it is, General. Montano and myself being in speech, there comes a fellow crying out for help and Cassio following him with determined sword to execute upon him. Sir, this gentleman steps into Cassio and entreats his pause. Myself, the crying fellow, did pursue, lest by his clamor, as it so fell out, the town might fall in fright. He, swift of foot, outran my purpose, and I returned the rather, for that I heard the clink and fall of swords, and Cassio high an oath, which till tonight I ne'er might say before. When I came back, for this was brief, I found them close together, at blow and thrust, even as again they were when you yourself did part them. More of this matter I cannot report, but men are men. The best sometimes forget, though Cassio did some little wrong to him, as men in rage strike those that wish them best. Yet surely Cassio, I believe, received from him that fled some strange indignity which patience could not pass. I know, Iago, thy honesty and love doth mince this matter, making it light to Cassio. Cassio, I love thee, but never more be officer of mine. Read it to Desdemona, attended. Look, if my gentle love be not raised up, I'll make thee an example. What's the matter? All's well now, sweeting. Come away to bed, sir. For your hurts, myself will be your surgeon. Lead him off. To Matana, who is let off. Iago, 
look with care about the town and silence those whom this vile brawl distracted. Come, Desdemona, tis the soldier's life to have their balmy slumbers wait with strife. Exeunt all but Iago and Cassio. What? Are you hurt, Lieutenant? I passed all surgery. Mary, heaven forbid. Reputation, reputation, reputation. Do I have lost my reputation? I have lost the immortal part of myself and what remains is bestial. My reputation, Iago, my reputation. As I am an honest man, I thought you had received some bodily wound. There is more sense in that than in reputation. Reputation is an idle and most false imposition, oft got without merit and lost without deserving. You have lost no reputation at all unless you repute yourself such a loser. But man, there are ways to recover the general again. You are but now cast in his mood, a punishment more in policy than in malice, even so as one would beat his offenseless dog to affright an imperious lion. Sue to him again, and he's yours. I will rather sue to be despised than to deceive so good a commander with so slight, so drunken, and so indiscreet an officer. Drunk? And speak parrot? And squabble? Swaggle? Swagger? Swear? and discourse fustian with one's own shadow. O oh, thou invisible spirit of wine, if thou hast no name to be known by, let us call thee devil. What was he that you followed with your sword? What had he done to you? I know not. Is it possible? I remember a mass of things, but nothing distinctly, a quarrel, but nothing wherefore, oh. God, that men should put an enemy in their mouths to steal away their brains. That we should with joy, pleasance, revel, and applause transforms ourselves into beasts. Why, but you are now well enough. How came you thus recovered? It hath pleased the devil drunkenness to give place to the devil wrath. One unperfectness shows me another to make me frankly despise myself. Come. You are too severe a moraler. As the time, the place, and the condition of this country stands, I could hardly wish this had not befallen. But since it is as it is, mend it for your own good. I will ask him for my place again. He shall tell me I am drunkard. Had I as many mouths as Hydra, such an answer would stop them all. To be now a sensible man, by and by a fool, and presently a beast. Oh, strange. Every inordinate cup is unblessed, and the ingredient is a devil. Come, come. Good wine is a good familiar creature, if it be well used. Exclaim no more against it. And good lieutenant, I think you think I love you. I have well approved it, sir. I drunk. You or any man living may be drunk at a time, man. I'll tell you what you shall do. Our general's wife is now the general, may say so in this respect, for that he hath devoted and given up himself to the contemplation, mark, and denotement of her parts and graces. Confess yourself freely to her. Importune her help to put you in your place again. She is of so free, so kind, so apt, so blessed a disposition. She holds it a vice in her goodness not to do more than she is requested. This broken joint between you and her husband entreat her to splinter. And my fortunes against any lay worth naming, this crack of your love shall grow stronger than it was before. You advise me well. I protest in the sincerity of love and honest kindness. I think it freely and betimes in the morning I will beseech the virtuous Desdemona to undertake for me. I am desperate and my fortunes, if they are, check me here. You are in the right. Good night, Lieutenant. I must to the watch. Exit. And what's he then that says I play the villain? 
when this advice is free, I give and honest, probable to thinking and indeed the course to win the moor again, for tis most easy, the inclining Desdemona to subdue in any honest suit. She's framed as fruitful as the free elements. And then for her to win the moor, were to renounce his baptism, all seals and symbols of redeemed sin, his soul is so infected to her love that she may make, unmake, do what she list, even as her appetite shall play the god with his weak function. How am I then a villain to counsel Castio to this parallel course directly to his good? Divinity of hell! When devils will the blackest sins put on, they do suggest at first with heavenly shows as I do now. For whiles this honest fool plies Desdemona to repair his fortunes, and she for him pleads strongly to the moor. I'll pour this pestilence into his ear that she repeals him for her body's lust. And by how much she strives to do him good, she shall undo her credit with the moor. So will I turn her virtue into pitch, and out of her own goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all. Read it to Rodrigo. How now, Rodrigo? I do follow here in the chase, not like a hound that hunts, but one that fills up the cry. My money is almost spent. I have been tonight exceedingly well cudgeled, and I think the issue will be I shall have so much experience for my pains, and so, with no money at all, and a little more wit, return again to Venice. How poor are they that have not patience? What wound did ever heal but by degrees? Thou knowst we work by wit, and not by witchcraft, and wit depends on dilatory time. Does not go well. Cassio hath beaten thee, and thou, by that small hurt, hath cashiered Cassio. Though other things grow fair against the sun, yet fruits that blossom first will first be ripe. Content thyself a while. By the mass, tis morning. Pleasure and action make the hours seem short. Retire thee. Go where thou art billeted. Away, I say, thou shalt no more hereafter. Nay, get thee gone. Exit, Rodrigo. Two things are to be done. My wife must move for Cassio to her mistress. I'll set her on. Myself the while to draw the more apart and bring him jump when he may Cassio find soliciting his wife. Ah, that's the way. Though not device by coldness and delay. Exit. Act three, scene one, before the castle. Enter Cassio and some musicians. Masters, play here. I will content your pains. Something that's brief. And bid good morrow, general. Music, enter clown. Why, masters, have your instruments been in Naples that they speak in the nose thus? Oh, sir, how? <clears throat> Are these, I pray you, wind instruments? I, uh, Mary, are they, sir? <laughs> Ooh, there, thereby hangs a tale. <laughs> Whereby hangs a tale, sir? Mary, sir, by many a wind instrument that I know. <laughs> but, masters, here's money for you. And the general so likes your music that he desires you, for love's sake, to make no more noise with it. Well, sir, we will not. If you have any music that may not be heard, to it again. But as they say, to hear music, the general does not greatly care. We have none such, sir. Then put up your pipes in your bag, for I'll away. Go, vanish into air, away. Exit, musicians. Dost thou hear, my honest friend? No, I hear not your honest friend, I hear you. Prithee, keep up thy honest quillets. There's a poor piece of gold for thee. If the gentlewoman that attends the general's wife be stirring, tell her there's one Cassio entreats her a little favor of speech. Wilt thou do, wilt thou do this? She is stirring, sir. If she will stir hither, I shall seem to notify unto her. Do good, my friend. Exit clown into Iago. Happy time, Iago. 
You have not been abed then. Why, no. The day had broke before we parted. I have made bold Iago to send in to your wife. My suit to her is that she will, to virtuous Desdemona, procure me some access. I'll send her to you presently, and I'll devise a mean to draw the moor out of the way that your converse and business may be more free. I humbly thank you for it. Exit Iago. I never knew a Florentine more kind and honest. Enter Emilia. Good morrow, good lieutenant. I am sorry for your displeasure, but all will sure be well. The general and his wife are talking of it, and she speaks for you stoutly. The Moor replies that he you hurt is of great fame in Cyprus and great affinity, in that in wholesome wisdom he might not but refuse you, but he protests he loves you and needs no other suitor but his likings to take the safest occasion by the front to bring you in again. Yet I beseech you, if you think fit or that it may be done, give me advantage of some brief discourse with Desdemona alone. Pray you, come in. I will bestow you where you shall have time to speak your bosom freely. I am much bound to you. Exeunt. Act three, scene two. A room in the castle. Enter Othello, Iago, and gentlemen. These letters give Iago to the pilot, and by him do my duties to the senate. That done, I will be walking on the works. Repair there to me. Well, my good lord, I'll do it. This fortification, gentlemen, shall we seat? We'll wait upon your lordship. Exeunt. Act three, scene three. The garden of the castle. Enter Desdemona, Cassio, and Amelia. Be thou assured, good Cassio, I will do all my abilities in thy behalf. Good madam, do. I warrant it grieves my husband as if the case were his. Oh, that's an honest fellow. Do not doubt, Cassio, but I will have my lord and you again as friendly as you were. Bounteous madam, whatever shall become, become of Michael Cassio, he's never anything but your true servant. I know it. I thank you. You do love my lord. You have known him long, and be you well assured, he shall in strangeness stand no further off than in a polite distance. Aye, but lady, that policy may either last so long or feed upon such a nice and waterish diet, or breed itself out so out of circumstance that that I being absent and my place supplied, my general, my general will forget my love and service. Do not doubt that. Before Amelia here, I give thee warrant of thy place. Assure thee, if I do vow a friendship, I'll perform it to the last article. My lord shall never rest. I'll watch him tame and talk him out of patience. His bed shall seem a school, his board a shrift. I'll intermingle everything he does with Cassio's suit. Therefore be merry, Cassio, for thy solicitor shall rather die than give thy cause away. Madam, here comes my lord. Madam, I'll take my leave. Why, stay and hear me speak. Madam, not now. I am very ill at ease, unfit for mine own purposes. Well, do your discretion. Exit Cassio, enter Othello and Diago. Huh. I like not that. What dost thou say? Nothing, my lord, or if <laughs> I know not what. Was not that Cassio parted from my wife? Cassio, uh, my lord, no, sure, I cannot think it that he would steal away so guilty like seeing you coming. I do believe twas he. How now, my lord? I have been talking with a suitor here, a man that languishes in your displeasure. Who is it you mean? Why, your lieutenant, Cassio. Good, my lord, if I have any grace or power to move you, his present reconciliation take. For if he be not one that truly loves you, that errs in ignorance and not in cunning, I have no judgment in an honest face. I prithee, call him back. Went he hence now? I, sooth, so humbled that he hath left part of his grief with me to suffer with him. Good love, call him back. Not now, sweet Desdemona, some other time. But shalt be shortly? The sooner, sweet, for you. Shalt be tonight at supper? No, not tonight. Tomorrow dinner, then? I shall not dine at home. I meet the captains at the Citadel. Why, then, 
tomorrow night or Tuesday morn on Tuesday noon or night on Wednesday morn I pray thee name the time but let it not exceed three days in faith he's penitent and yet his trespass and our common reason save that they say the wars must make examples out of their best is not almost a fault to incur a private check when shall he come tell me Othello I wonder in my soul what you would ask me that I should deny or stand so mannering on what michael cassio that came a-wooing with you and so many a time when i have spoke of you dispraisingly have taken your part to have so much to do to bring him in trust me i could do much prithee no more let him come when he will i will deny thee nothing <laughs> this is not a boon tis as i should entreat you wear your gloves or feed on nourishing dishes or keep you warm or sue to you to do a peculiar profit to your own person. Nay, when I have a suit wherein I mean to touch your love indeed, shall be full of poise and difficult weight and fearful to be granted. I will deny thee nothing, whereon I do beseech thee, grant me this, to leave me but a little to myself. Shall I deny you? No. Farewell, my lord. Farewell, my Desdemona. I'll come to thee straight. Amelia, come. Be as your fancies teach you, whatever you be. I am obedient. Excellent, Desdemona and Amelia. Excellent wretch. Perdition catch my soul, but I do love thee. And when I love thee not, chaos is come again. My noble lord. What dost thou say, Iago? Did Michael Cassio, when you wooed my lady, know of your love? He did from first to last. Why dost thou ask? But for a satisfaction of my thought, no further harm. Why of thy thought, Iago? I did not think he had been acquainted with her. <laughs> yes, and went between us very oft. Indeed. Indeed, I indeed. Distarts thou aught in that? Is he not honest? Honest, my lord. Honest, I honest. My lord, for aught I know. What dost thou think? Think, my lord. Think, my lord? By heaven, he echoes me, as if there was some monster in his thought too hideous to be shown. Thou dost mean something. I heard thee say, even now, thou likest not that. When Cassio left my wife, what didst not like? And when I told thee he was of my counsel in my whole course of wooing, thou criedst, indeed, and didst contract and purse thy brow together, as if thou hadst shut up in thy brain some horrible conceit. If thou dost love me, show me thy thought. My lord, you know I love you. I think thou dost. And for I know thou art full of love and honesty, and waits thy words before thou givest them breath. Therefore, these stops of thine fright me the more. For such things in a false disloyal name are tricks of custom, but in a man that's just, they are close delations, working from the heart that passion cannot rule. For Michael Cassio, I dare be sworn, I think that he is honest. I think so too. Men should be what they seem, or those that be not, would they might seem none. Certain men should be what they seem. Why then, I think Cassio's an honest man. Nay, yet there's more in this. I prithee, speak to me as to thy thinkings, and thou, as thou dost ruminate, and give thy worst of thoughts the worst of words. Good, my lord, pardon me. Though I am bound to every act of duty, I am not bound to that all slaves are free to. Utter my thoughts? Why, say they are vile and false. As where's that palace wherein two foul things sometimes intrude not? Who has a breast so pure, but some uncleanly apprehensions keep leets and law days and in session sit with meditations lawful? Thou dost conspire against thy friend, Diago. If thou but think'st him wronged and makest his ear a stranger to thy thoughts. I do beseech you, though I perchance 
and vicious in my guess. As I confess, it is my nature's plague to spy into abuses, and oft my jealousy shapes faults that are not, that your wisdom yet from one that so imperfectly conceits would take no notice, nor build yourself a trouble out of his scattering and unsure observance. It were not for your quiet, nor your good, nor for my manhood, honesty, or wisdom to let you know my thoughts. What dost thou mean? Good name in man and woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse steals trash, tis something nothing. T'was mine, tis his, and has been slaved to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. By heaven, I'll know thy thoughts. You cannot, if my heart were in your hand, nor shall not whilst tis in my custody. <laughs> oh, beware, my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on, that cuckold lives in bliss, who, certain of his fate, loves not his wronger. But oh, what damned minutes tell he or who dotes, yet doubt suspects it strongly loves. Misery! Poor and content is rich and rich enough, but rich as fineless is as poor as winter to him that ever hears he shall be poor. Good heaven, the souls of all my tribe defend from jealousy. Why, why is this? Think'st thou I'll make a lie of jealousy to follow still the changes of the moon with fresh suspicions? No, to be once in doubt is once to be resolved. Exchange me for a goat when I shall turn the business, busyness of my soul to such exufflicate and blown surmises matching thy inference? Tis not to make me jealous to say my wife is fair, feeds well, loves company, is free of speech, sings, plays, and dances well, where virtue is, these are more virtuous. Nor from mine own weak merits will I draw the smallest fear or doubt of her revolt, for she had eyes and chose me. No, Iago, I'll see before I doubt. When I doubt, prove, and on the proof, there is no more but this, away at once with love or jealousy. I am glad of it, for now I shall have reason to show the love and duty that I bear you with franker spirit. Therefore, as I am bound, receive it from me. I speak not yet of proof. Look to your wife. Observe her well with Cassio. Wear your eye thus, not jealous nor secure. I would not have your free and noble nature out of self-bounty be abused. Look to it. I know our country disposition well. In Venice they do let heaven see the pranks they dare not show their husbands. Their best conscience is not to leave undone, but keep unknown. Dost thou say so? She did deceive her father marrying you. And when she seemed to shake and fear your looks, she loved them most. And so she did. Why go to then? She that so young could give out such a seeming to seal her father's eyes up close as oak, he thought was witchcraft. But I am much to blame. I humbly do beseech you of your pardon for too much loving you. I am bound to thee forever. I see this half a little dashed your spirits. Not a jot, not a jot. In faith, I fear it has. I hope you will consider what is spoke comes from my love, but I do see your mood. I am to pray you not to strain my speech to grosser issues, nor to larger reach than to suspicion. I will not. Should you do so, my lord, my speech should fall into such vile success as my thoughts aim not at. Cassio's my worthy friend. My lord, I see you're moved. No, not much moved. I do think but Desdemona's honest. Long live she so, and long live you to think so. And yet... How nature erring from itself. Ah, there's the point. As to be bold with you, not to affect many 
proposed matches of her own clime, complexion, and degree, whereto we see in all things nature tends. <laughs> One may smell in such a will, most rank, foul, disproportioned thoughts unnatural, but pardon me, I do not in position distinctly speak of her, though I may fear her will, recoiling to her better judgment, may fall to match you with her country forms and happily repent. Farewell, farewell. If more thou dost perceive, let me know more. Set on thy wife to observe. Leave me, Iago. Going. My lord, I'll take my leave. Why did I marry? This honest creature doubtless sees and knows more, much more than he unfolds. Returning. My lord, I would I might entreat your honor to scan this thing no further. Leave it to time. Though it be fit that Cassio have his place, for sure he fills it up with great ability. Yet, if you please to hold off a while, you shall by that perceive him and his means. Note, if your lady strain his entertainment with any strong or vehement importunity, much will be seen in that. In the meantime, let me be thought too busy in my fears, as worthy cause I have to fear I am, and hold her free. I do beseech your honor. Fear not, my government. I once more take my leave. Exit. This fellows of exceeding honesty, and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. If I do prove her haggard, Though that her jesses were my dear heartstrings, I'll whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray at fortune. Happily, for I am black and have not those soft parts of conversation that chambers have, or for I am declined into the veil of years, yet that's not much. She's gone. I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. Oh, curse of marriage, that we can call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetites. I had rather be a toad and live upon the vapor of a dungeon than keep a corner in the thing I love for others' uses. Yet, tis the plague of great ones. Prerogatived are they less than the base. Tis destiny, unshunable like death. Even then this forked plague is fated to us when we do quicken. Desdemona comes. Re-enter Desdemona and Amelia. If she be false, oh, then heaven mocks itself. I'll not believe it. How now, my dear Othello? <sighs> Dinner, and the generous islanders by you invited do attend your presence. I am to blame. Why do you speak so faintly? Are you not well? I have a, a pain upon my forehead here. Faith, hey, that's with watching. Twill away again. Let me but bind it hard with this hour. It will be well. Your napkin is too little. He puts the handkerchief from him and it drops. Uh, let it alone. Come. I'll go in with you. I'm very sorry that you are not well. Exit Othello and Desdemona. I am glad I have found this napkin. Mm. This was her first remembrance from the moor. My wayward husband hath a hundred times wooed me to steal it, but she so loves the token, for he conjured her she should ever keep it that she reserves that evermore about her to kiss and talk to. I'll have the work taken out and give it Iago. What he will do with it, heaven knows, not I. I nothing but to please his fantasy. Re-enter Iago. How oh, now? What do you hear alone? Do not you chide. I have a thing for you. A thing for me? It is a common thing <laughs> to have a foolish wife. Oh, is that all? What will you give me now for the same handkerchief? What handkerchief? What handkerchief? 
why that the moor first gave to Desdemona, that which so often you did bid me steal. Has stolen it from her? No, faith. She let it drop by negligence, and to the advantage I, being here, took it up. Look, here it is. A good wench, give it me. What will you do with it, that you have been so earnest to have me filch it? Snatching it. Why? What's that to you? If it be not for some purpose of import, give it me again. Poor lady, she'll run mad when she shall lack it. Be not unknown on it. I have use for it. Go, leave me. Exit Amelia. I will in Cassio's lodging lose this napkin and let him find it. Trifles light as air are to the jealous confirmation strong as proofs of holy writ. This may do something. The moor already changes with my poison. Dangerous conceits are in their natures poisons, which at the first are scarce found to distaste, but with a little act upon the blood, burn like the mines of sulphur. I did say so. Look where he comes. And re-enter Othello. Not poppy, nor mandragora, nor all the drowsy syrups of the world shall ever medicine thee to that sweet sleep which thou owest yesterday. Ha! False to me? Mm. Oh, well, I, how not, General? No more of that. Avaunt! Be gone! Thou hast set me on the rack. I swear tis better to be much abused than but not a little. How now, my lord? What sense had I of her stolen hours of lust? I sought not, thought it not, it harmed not me. I slept the next night well, was free and merry. I fell not Cassio's kisses on her lips. He that is robbed, not wanting what is stolen, let him not note, and he's not robbed at all. I am sorry to hear this. I had been happy if the general camp, piners and all, had tasted her sweet body, so I had nothing known. Oh, now forever farewell the tranquil mind, farewell content, farewell the plumed troop and the big wars that make ambition virtue. Oh, farewell, farewell the name steed and the shrill trump, the spirit-stirring drum, the ear-piercing fight, the royal banner, and all quality, pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. And you mortal engines whose rude throats the immortal Jove's dead clamors counterfeit, farewell. A fellow's occupation is gone. Is possible, my lord. Villain, be sure thou prove my love a whore. Be sure of it. Give me the ocular proof. Or by the worth of man's eternal soul, thou hadst been better have been born a dog than answer my waked wrath. Is come to this. Make me to see it. Or... At the least, so prove it that the probation bear no hinge nor loop to hang a doubt on or woe upon thy life. My noble lord. If thou dost slander her and torture me, never pray more, abandon all remorse on horror's head, horrors accumulate, do deeds to make heaven weep, all earth amaze, for nothing canst thou to damnation add greater than that. Oh, grace, oh heaven, forgive me. Are you a man? Have you a soul or sense? God be with you, take mine office, oh wretched fool that lives to make thine honesty a vice. Oh, monstrous world, take note, take note, a world to be direct and honest is not safe. I thank you for this prophet, and from hence I'll love no friend, since love breeds such offense. Nay, stay. Thou shouldst be honest. I should be wise, for honesty is a fool and loses that it works for. By the world, I think my wife be honest and think she is not. I think that thou art just, and think thou art not. I'll have some proof. Her name, 
that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as mine own face. If there be cords or knives, poison or fire or suffocating streams, I will not endure it. Would I were satisfied? I see, sir, you are eaten up with passion. I do repent me that I put it to you. You would be satisfied? Would? Nay, I will. And may. But how, how satisfied, my lord, would you, the supervisor, grossly gape on, behold her top? Death and damnation! Ah! It were a tedious difficulty, I think, to bring them to that prospect. Damn them, then! If ever mortal eyes do see them bolster more than their own. What then? How then? What shall I say? Where's satisfaction? It is impossible you should see this. Were they as prime as goats, as hot as monkeys, as soft as wolves in pride, and fools as gross as ignorance made drunk? But yet, I say, if imputation and strong circumstances which lead directly to the door of truth will give you satisfaction, you may have it. Give me a living reason she's disloyal. I do not like the office, but Sith, I am entered in this cause so far, pricked to it by foolish honesty and love, I will go on. I lay with Cassio lately, and being troubled with a raging tooth, I could not sleep. There are a kind of men so loose of soul that in their sleeps will mutter their affairs. One of this kind is Cassio. In sleep I heard him say, sweet Desdemona, let us be wary, let us hide our loves. And then, sir, would he gripe and wring my hand, cry, oh, sweet creature, and then kiss me hard as if he plucked up kisses by the roots that grew upon my lips, then laid his leg over my thigh and sighed and kissed, and then cried, cursed fate that gave thee to the moor. Oh, monstrous, monstrous. Nay, this was but his dream. But this denoted a foregone conclusion. Tis a shrewd doubt, though it be but a dream. And this may help to thicken other proofs that do demonstrate thinly. I'll tear her all to pieces. Nay, but be wise, yet we see nothing done. She may be honest, yet tell me but this. Have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? I gave her such a one. Twas my first gift. I know not that, but such a handkerchief. I am sure it was your wife's. Did I today see Cassio wipe his beard with? If it be that. If it be that, or any that was hers, it speaks against her with the other proofs. Ah, oh, that the slave had 40,000 lives. One is too poor, too weak for my revenge. Now, do I see tis true? It, look here, Iago. All my fond love thus do I blow to heaven. Tis gone. Arise, black vengeance, from thy hollow cell, yield up thy love, thy crown, and hearted throne to tyrannous hate. Swell bosom with thy fraught, for tis of aspic's tongues. Yet be content. Oh, blood, blood, blood! Patience, I say, your mind perhaps may change. Never, Iago! like to the Pontic Sea, whose icy current and compulsive course ne'er feels retiring ebb, but feels due on to the Propontic and the Hellspont. Even so, my bloody thoughts with violent pace shall ne'er look back, ne'er ebb to humble love, till that a capable and wide revenge swallow them up. Now, by yond marble heaven, in Eels. the due reverence of a sacred vow, I here engage my words. Do not rise yet. Niels. Witness, you ever-burning lights above, you elements that clip us round about. Witness that here Iago doth give up the execution of his wit, hands, heart, to wronged Othello's service. Let him command, 
and to obey shall be in me remorse. What bloody business? They rise. I greet thy love, not with vain thanks, but with acceptance, bounteous, and will upon the instant put thee to it. Within these three days, let me hear thee say that Cassio's not alive. My friend is dead. Tis done at your request, but let her live. Damn her, lewd minx. Oh, damn her. Come, go with me apart. I will withdraw to furnish me some swift means of death for the fair devil. Now art thou my lieutenant. I am your own forever. Excellent. That now concludes our first half. We will now take a brief intermission. We will return in five minutes.
Welcome back to the International Shakespeare Players presentation of Othello. We will be resum resuming with Act 3, Scene 4. Before the castle, enter Desdemona, Emilia, and Clown. Do you know, Sarah, where Lieutenant Cassio lies? I dare not say he lies anywhere. Why, man? He's a soldier, and for one to say a soldier lies is ah, stabbing. Go to, where lodges he? To tell you where he lodges is to tell you where I lie. Can anything be made of this? I know not where he lodges, and for me to devise a lodging and say he lies here or he lies there were to lie in mine own throat. Can you inquire him out and be edified by report? I will catechize him, the world, the world for him. That is, make questions and by them answer. Seek him, bid him come hither. Tell him I have moved my lord on his behalf and hope all will be well. To do this is within the compass of man's wit and therefore I will attempt the doing it. Exit. Where should I lose that handkerchief, Amelia? I know not, madam. Believe me, I had rather have lost my purse full of prosedos. And my noble moor is true of mind and made of no such baseness as jealous creatures are. It were enough to put him to ill thinking. Is he not jealous? Who, he? I think the son where he was born drew all such humors from him. And look where he comes. I will not leave him now till Cassio be called to him. Enter Othello. How is it with you, my lord? Well, my good lady. Aside. Oh, hardness to dissemble. How do you, Desdemona? Well, my good lord. Give me your hand. This hand is moist, my lady. It yet hath felt no age, nor known no sorrow. This argues fruitfulness and liberal heart. Hot. Hot and moist. This hand of yours requires a sequester from liberty, fasting and prayer, much castigation, exercise, devout, for he is a young and sweating devil here that commonly rebels. Tis a good hand, a frank one. You may indeed say so, for twas that hand that gave away my heart. A liberal hand. The hearts of old gave hands, but our new heraldry is hands, not hearts. I cannot speak of this. Come now, your promise. What promise, Chuck? I have sent to bid Cassio come speak with you. I have a salt and sorry room offends me. Lend me thy handkerchief. Uh, here, my lord. That which I gave you. I have it not about me. Not? No, indeed, my lord. That is a fault. That handkerchief did an Egyptian to my mother give. She was a charmer and could almost read the thoughts of people. She told her, while she kept it, twould make her amenable and subdue my father entirety to her love but if she lost it or made gift of it my father's eye should hold her loathed and his spirits should hunt after new fancies she dying gave it me and bid me when my fate would have me wive to give it her i did so and take heed, aunt, make it a darling like your precious eye. To lose or give away were such perdition as nothing else could match. Is it possible? Tis true. There's magic in the web of it. A sibyl that had numbered in the world the sun to course two hundred compasses in her prophetic fury sowed the work. The worms were hallowed that did breed the silk, and it was dyed in mummy, which the skillful conserved of maidens' hearts. Indeed, is it true? Most veritable. 
therefore look to it well. Then would to God that I had never seen it. Ha! <laughs> Wherefore? Why do you speak so startlingly and rash? Is lost? Is gone? Speak. Is out of the way? Heaven, bless us. Say you? It is not lost. But what and if it were? How? I say, it is not lost. Fetch. Let me see it. Why, so I can, sir, but I will not now. This is a trick to put me from my suit. Pray you, let Cassio be received again. Fetch me the handkerchief. My mind misgives. Come, come. You'll never meet a more sufficient man. The handkerchief. I pray, talk me of Cassio. The handkerchief. A man that all his time hath founded his good fortunes on your love, shared dangers with you. The handkerchief. In sooth, you are to blame. Go away. Exit. Is not this man jealous? I ne'er saw this before. Sure, there's some wonder in this handkerchief. I am most unhappy in the loss of it. Tis not a year or two shows us a man. They are all but stomachs, and we all but food. They eat us hungrily, and when they are full, they belch us. And look you, Cassio and my husband. Enter Cassio and Iago. There is no other way. Tis she must do it, and lo, the happiness. Go and importune her. How now, good Cassio? What's the news with you? Madam, my former suit, I do beseech you that by your virtuous means I may again exist and be a member of his love, whom I with all the office of my heart entirely honor, I would not be delayed. If my office be of such mortal kind that nor my service past, nor present sorrows, nor purposed merit in, in futurity can ransom me into his love again, but to know so much be my benefit. So I shall clothe me in a forced content and shut myself up in some other course to fortune's alms. Alas, thrice gentle Cassio, my advocation is not now in tune. My lord is not my lord, nor should I know him. Were he in favor as in humor altered? So help me every spirit sanctified, as I have spoken for you all my best and stood within the blank of his displeasure for my free speech. You must a while be patient. What I can do, I will, and more I will than for myself I dare. Let that suffice you. Is my lord angry? He went hence but now, and certainly in strange and quietness. Can he be angry? I have seen the cannon when it hath blown his ranks into the air and like the devil from his very arm puffed his own brother. And can he be angry? Something of moment then, I will go meet him. There's manner in it indeed if he be angry. I prithee, do so. Exit Iago. Something sure of state, either from Venice or some unhatched practice made demonstrable here in Cyprus to him, hath puddled his clear spirit. And in such cases, men's natures wrangle with inferior things, though great ones are their object. Tis even so, for let our finger ache, and it endues our other healthful members even to that sense of pain. Nay, we must think men are not gods, nor of them look for such observances as fit the bridle. Beshrew me much, Amelia. I was an handsome warrior as I am, arraigning his unkindness with my soul. But now I find I had stubborn to witness, and he's addicted falsely. Pray, heaven, it be state matters as you think, and no conception nor no jealous toy concerning you. Alas, the day! I never gave him cause. But jealous souls will not be answered so. They are not ever jealous for the cause, but jealous for they are jealous. Tis a monster begot upon itself, born on itself. Heaven, keep that monster from Othello's mind. Lady, amen. I will go seek him. Cassio, walk hereabout. If I do find him fit, I'll move your suit and seek to effect it to my uttermost. I humbly thank your ladyship. Exeunt Desdemona and Amelia enter Bianca. Save you, Cassio. What, make you from home? How is it with you, my most fair Bianca? Faith, sweet love, I was coming to your house. And I was going to your lodging, Cassio. What keep a week away? Seven days and nights, eight score, eight hours. 
and lovers absent hours more tedious than the dial eight scores times. Oh, weary reckoning. Pardon me, Bianca, I have this while with leaden thoughts been pressed, but I shall in more continuate time strike off this score of absence. Sweet Bianca. Give him your Desdemona's handkerchief. Take me this work out. Oh, uh, Cassia, whence came this? This is some token from a newer friend. To the felt absence now, I feel a cause. It's come to this. Well, well. Go to, woman, throw your vile guesses in the devil's teeth. From whence you have them, you are jealous now that this is from some mistrance, some remembrance. No, in good troth, Bianca. Why, whose is it? I know not, sweet. I found it in my chamber. I like the work well, ere it be demanded, as like enough it will. I'll have it copied. Take it and do it, and leave me for this time. Leave you? Wherefore? I do attend here on the general, and think it no addition, nor my wish to have him see me womaned. Why, I pray you. Not that I love you not. But that you do not love me. I pray you, bring me on the way a little, and say if I shall see you soon at night. It's but a little way that I can bring you, for I attend here, but I'll see you soon. Tis very good. I must be circumstanced. Exeunt. Act four, scene one, Cyprus before the castle. Enter Othello and Diago. Will you think so? Think so, Iago. What, to kiss in private? An unauthorized kiss. Or to be naked with a friend in bed, an hour or more not meaning any harm? Naked in bed, Iago, and not mean harm. It is hypocrisy against the devil. They that mean virtuously and yet do so, the devil their virtue tempts, and they tempt heaven. So they do nothing, tis a venial slip. But if I give my wife a handkerchief... What then? Why then, tis hers, my lord, and being hers, she may, I think, bestow it on any man. She is protectress of her honor, too. May she give that? Her honor is an essence that's not seen. They have it very oft that have it not, but for the handkerchief. By heaven, I would most gladly have forgot it. Thou saidst it comes o'er my memory, as doth the raven o'er the infected house, boding to all. He had a handkerchief. Aye, what of that? That's not so good now. What if I had said I had seen him do you wrong? Or heard him say, as knaves be such abroad, who having by their own importunate suit or voluntary dotage of some mistress, convinced or supplied them, cannot choose but they must blab. Hath he said anything? He hath, my lord, but you, but be you well assured, no more than he'll unswear. What hath he said? Faith that he did. I know not what he did. What? What? Lie. With her? With her, on her, what you will. Lie with her, lie on her. We say lie on her when they belie her. Lie with her, that's fulsome. Handkerchief, confessions, handkerchief. To confess and be hanged for his labor. First to be hanged and then to confess. I tremble at it. Nature would not invest herself in such shadowing passion without some instruction. It is not words that sh sh shake me thus. Nose, ears, lips. It's possible. Confess. Handkerchief. Oh, devil. Falls, falls in a trance. <laughs> Work on, my medicine, work. Thus credulous fools are caught, and many worthy and chaste dames even thus, all guiltless meet reproach. What ho, my lord? My lord, I say, Othello. Enter Cassio. How now, Cassio? What's the matter? My lord has fallen into an epilepsy. This is his second fit. He had one yesterday. 
about the temples. No, forbear. The lethargy must have his quiet course. If not, he foams at mouth and by and by breaks out to savage madness. Look, he stirs. Do you withdraw yourself a little while? He will recover straight. When he is gone, I would on great occasion speak with you. Exocasio. How is it, General? Have you not hurt your head? Dost thou mock me? I mock you. No, by heaven. Would you would bear your fortune like a man? A horned man's a monster and a beast. There's many a beast then in a populous city and many a civil monster. Did he confess it? Good sir, be a man. Think every bearded fellow that's but yoked may draw with you. There's millions now alive that nightly lie in their unproper beds which they dare swear peculiar. Your case is better. Tis the spite of hell, the fiend's arch mock to lip a wanton in a secure couch and to suppose her chaste. No, let me know, and knowing what I am, I know what she shall be. Oh, thou art wise, tis certain. Stand you a while apart. Confine yourself but in a patient list. Whilst you were here, overwhelmed with your grief, a passion most unsuiting such a man. Cassio came hither. I shifted him away and laid good excuse upon your ecstasy, bade him anon return and here speak with me. The which he promised, do but encave yourself and mark the fleers, the jibes, the notable scorns that dwell in every region of his face. For I will make him tell the tale and you where, how, how oft, how long ago, and when he hath and is again to cope your wife. I say, but mark his gesture. Mary, patience, or I shall say you are all in all in spleen and nothing of a man. Dost thou hear, Iago? I will be found most cunning in my patience. But dost thou hear? Most bloody. That's not amiss. But yet keep time in all. Will you withdraw? Othello retires. Now will I question Cassio of Bianca, a housewife that by selling her desires buys herself bread and clothes. It is a creature that dotes on Cassio, as tis the strumpet's plague to beguile many than be beguiled by one. He, when he hears of her, cannot refrain from the excess of laughter. Here he comes. Re-enter Cassio. As he shall smile, Othello shall go mad, and his unbookish jealousy must construe poor Cassio's smiles, gestures, and light behavior quite in the wrong. How do you now, Lieutenant? The worser that you give me the addition whose want even kills me. Fly, Desdemona, well, and you are sure on it. Speaking lower. Now, if this suit lay in Bianco's power, how quickly should you speed? Alas, poor caitiff. <laughs> Look how he laughs already. I never knew woman love man so. Alas, poor rogue. I think of faith she loves me. Now he denies it faintly and laughs it out. Do you hear, Cassio? Now he importunes him to tell her all. Go to, well said, well said. She gives it out that you shall marry her? <laughs> do you intend it? <laughs> do you triumph, Roman? Do you triumph? I marry her. What a customer. Prithee, bear some charity to my wit. Do not think I am so unwholesome. <laughs> so, 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 they laugh that win. Hey, the cry goes that you shall marry her. Oh, pretty, say true. I am a very villain else. Have you scored me? Well. This the monkey's own giving out. She is persuaded I will marry her out of her own love and flattery, not out of my promise. Iago beckons me. Now he begins the story. She was here even now. She haunts me in every place. I was the other day talking on the sea bank with certain Venetians, and thither comes the bauble, and by this hand she falls me thus about my neck. Crying, oh dear Cassio, as it were, his gesture imports it. So hangs and lulls and weeps upon me, so hails and pulls me. <laughs> 
Now he tells how she plucked him to my chamber. Oh, I see that nose of yours, but not that dog I shall throw it to. Well, I must leave her company. Before me, look where she comes. Oh, tis such a fit you marry a perfumed one. Enter Bianco. What do you mean by this haunting of me? Let the devil and his damn haunt you. What did you mean by that same handkerchief you gave me even now? I was a fine fool to take it. I must take out the work, a likely piece of work that you should find it in your chamber and not know who left it there. This is the minx token, and I must take out the work. There, give it your hobby horse. Wheresoever you had it, I'll take out no work, aunt. Now, my sweet Bianca, how now, how now? By heaven, that should be my handkerchief. And you'll come to supper tonight? You may, and you will not. Come when you are next prepared for. Exit. After her, after her. Faith, I must, she'll rail in the street else. Will you sup there? Faith, I intend to. Well, I may chance to see you, for I would very fain speak with you. Prithee, come, will you? Go to, say, no more. Exit Cassio. Advancing. How shall I murder him, Iago? Did you see, did you perceive how he laughed at his vice? Oh, Iago! And did you see the handkerchief? Was that mine? Yours by this hand. And to see how he prizes the foolish woman, your wife. She gave it him, and he hath given it to his whore. I would have him nine years a killing. A fine woman, a fair woman, a sweet woman. Nay, you must forget that. I let her rot and perish and be damned tonight, for she shall not live. No, my heart is turned to stone. I strike it, and it hurts my hand. Oh, the world hath not a sweeter creature. She might lie by an emperor's side and command him tasks. Nay, that's not your way. Hang her. I do but say what she is. So delicate with her needle, an admirable musician. Oh, she will sing the savageness out of a bear of so high and plenteous wit and invention. She's the worse for all this. Oh, a thousand, thousand times. And then of so gentle a condition. I <laughs> too gentle. Nay, that's certain. But yet the pity of it, Iago. Oh, Iago, the pity of it, Iago. If you are so fond over her iniquity, give her patent to offend. For if it touch not you, it comes near nobody. I will chop her into messes. Tis foul in her. With mine officer. That's fouler. Get me some poison, Iago. This night I'll not expostulate with her, lest her body and beauty unprovide my mind again. <laughs> then this night, Iago. Do it not with poison. Strangle her in her bed, even the bed she hath contaminated. Good, good. The justice of it pleases. Very good. And as for Cassio, let me be his undertaker. You shall hear more by midnight. Excellent, good. A trumpet within. What trumpet is that same? Something from Venice, sure. Tis Lodovico come from the Duke and see your wife is with him. Enter Lodovico, Desdemona, and attendants. Save you, worthy general. With all my heart, sir. The Duke and senators of Venice greet you. Gives him a letter. I kiss the instrument of their pleasures. Opens the letter and reads. And what's the news, good cousin Lodovico? I am very glad to see you, Signor. Welcome to Cyprus. I thank you. How does Lieutenant Cassio? Lives, sir. Cousin, there's fallen between him and my lord an unkind breach, but you shall make all well. Are you sure of that? My lord? Reads. This fail you not to do as you will. He did not call. He's busy in the paper. 
Is there a division twixt my lord and Cassio? A most unhappy one. I would do much to atone them for the love I bear to Cassio. Fire and brimstone! My lord! Are you wise? What? Is he angry? Maybe the letter moved him, for as I think they do command him home, deputing Cassio and his government. Trust me, I am glad, aunt. Indeed! My lord! I am glad to see you, mad. Why, sweet Othello! Striking her. Devil! I have not deserved this! My lord! This would not be believed in Venice, though I should swear I saw it tis very much. Make her amends. She weeps. Oh, devil, devil, if that the earth could teem with woman's tears, each drop she falls would prove a crocodile out of my sight. I will not stay to offend you. Going. Truly an obedient lady. I do beseech your lordship, call her back. Mistress. My lord? What would you with her, sir? Who, I, my lord? I. You did wish that I would make her turn? Sir, she can turn and turn and yet go on and turn again. And she can weep, sir, weep. And she's obedient, as you say, obedient, very obedient. Proceed you in your tears. Concerning this, sir, oh, well, painted passion. I am commanded home. Get you away. I'll send for you anon. Sir, I obey the mandate and will return to Venice. Hence, avant. Exit Desdemona. Cassio shall have my place. And, sir, tonight I do entreat that we may sup together. You are welcome, sir, to Cyprus. Goats and monkeys! Exit. Is this the noble moor whom our full senate call all in all sufficient? Is this the nature whom passion could not shake, whose solid virtue the shot of accident nor dart of chance could neither graze nor pierce? He is much changed. Are his wits safe? Is he not light of brain? He's that he is. I may not breathe my censure what he might be. If that he might, he is not. I would to heaven he were. But strike his wife. Faith, that was not so well. Yet what I knew that stroke would prove the worst. Is it his use? Or did the letters work upon his blood and new create this fault? Alas, alas. It is not honesty in me to speak what I have seen and known. You shall observe him. And his own courses will denote him so that I may save my speech. Do but go after and mark how he continues. I am sorry that I am deceived in him. Act four, scene two, a room in the castle. Enter Othello and Amelia. You have seen nothing then? Nor ever heard, nor ever did suspect. Yes, you have seen Cassio and she together. But then I saw no harm. And then I heard each syllable that breath made up between them. What, did they never whisper? Never, my lord. Nor send you out of the way. Never. To fetch her fan, her gloves, her mask, nor nothing? Never, my lord. That's strange. I durst, my lord, to wager she is honest. Lay down my soul at stake. If you think other, remove your thought. It doth abuse your bosom. If any wretch have put this in your head, let heaven requite it with the serpent's curse. For if she be not honest, chaste, and true, there's no man happy. The purest of their wives is 
foul as slander. Bid her come hither. Go. Exit Amelia. She says enough, yet she's a simple bawd that cannot say as much. This is a subtle whore, a closet lock and key of villainous secrets, and yet she'll kneel and pray. I have seen her do't. Enter Desdemona with Amelia. My lord, what is your will? Pray, Chuck. Come hither. What is your pleasure? Let me see your eyes. Look in my face. What horrible fancy is this? To Amelia. Some of your function, mistress. Leave procreants alone and shut the door. Cough or cry him if anybody come. Your mystery, your mystery, nay, dispatch. Exit Amelia. Upon my knees, what doth your speech import? I understand a fury in your words, but not the words. Why, what art thou? Your wife, my lord, your true and loyal wife. Come, swear it, damn thyself, lest being like one of heaven, the devils themselves should fear to seize thee. Therefore, be double damned, swear thou art honest. Heaven doth truly know it. Heaven truly knows that thou art false as hell. To whom, my lord? With whom? How am I false? Oh, Desdemona. Away, away, away. Alas, the heavy day. Why do you weep? Am I the motive of these tears, my lord? If haply you, my father, do suspect an instrument of this you're calling back, lay not your blame on me. If you have lost him, why, I have lost him too. Had it pleased heaven to try me with affliction, had they rained all kinds of sores and shames upon my bare head, steeped me in poverty to the very lips, given to the captivity of me and my utmost hopes, I should have found in some place of my soul a drop of patience. But, alas, to make me a fixed figure for the time of scorn to point this slow, unmoving finger at. Yet could I bear that too? Well, very well. But there, where I have garnered up my heart, where either I must live or bear no life, the fountain from the which my current runs or else dries up to be discarded thence, or keep it as a cistern for foul toads to not engender in. Turn thy complexion there, patience, thou young and rose-lipped cherub, and I there look grim as hell. I hope my noble lord esteems me honest. Uh, I as summer flies are in the shambles that quicken even with blowing. Oh, thou weed, who art so lovely fair and smellst so sweet that the sense aches at thee when thou hadst never been born. Alas, what ignorant sin have I committed? Was this fair paper, this most goodly book, made to write whore upon? What? Committed! Committed! Ah, oh, thou public commoner! I should make very forges of my cheeks that would to cinders burn up modesty, did I but speak thy deeds. What? Committed! Heaven stops the nose at it, and the moon winks the body, and wind that kisses all it meets is hushed within the hollow mine of earth, and will not hear it. What committed? Impudent strumpet. By heaven, you do me wrong. Are you not a strumpet? No, as I am a Christian. Oh. If to preserve this vessel for my lord from any other foul unlawful touch, be not to a strumpet. I am none. What? Not a whore? No, as I shall be saved. 
It's possible? Oh, heaven forgive us! I cry you mercy then. I took you for that cunning whore of Venice that married with Othello. Raising you, his voice. Mistress, that have the office opposite to St. Peter and keep the gate of hell. Re-enter Amelia. You, you, I, you. We have done our course. There's money for your pains. I pray you, turn the key and keep our counsel. Exit. Alas, what does this gentleman conceive? How do you, madam? How do you, my good lady? Pain. Half asleep. Good madam, what's the matter with my lord? With who? With, why, my lord, madam. Who is thy lord? He that is yours, sweet lady. I have none. Do not talk to me, Amelia. I cannot weep. Nor answer have I none. But what should I go by water? Prithee tonight, lay on my bed my wedding sheets. Remember, and call thy husband hither. Here's a change indeed. Exit. This meat I should be used so. Very meat. How have I be been behaved that he might stick the smallest opinion on my least misuse? Rain to Amelia and Iago. What is your pleasure, madam? How is it with you? I cannot tell. Those that do teach young babes do it with gentle means and easy tasks. You might have chid me so, for in good faith, I'm a child to chiding. What's the matter, lady? Alas, Iago! My lord hath so behoard her, thrown such despite and heavy terms upon her as true hearts cannot bear. Am I that name, Iago? What name, fair lady? Such as she says, my lord, did say I was. He called her a whore. A beggar in his drink could not have laid such terms upon his callet. Why did he so? I do not know. I am sure I am none such. Do not weep. Do not weep. Alas, the day. Hath she forsook so many noble matches, her father and her country and her friends, to be called whore? Would it not make one weep? It is my wretched fortune. Beshrew him for it. How comes this trick upon him? Nay, heaven doth know. I will be hanged if some eternal villain, some busy and insinuating rogue, some cogging, cousining slave, to get some office, have not devised this slander, I'll be hanged else. Fie, there is no such man, it is impossible. <sighs> if any such there be, heaven pardon him. A halter pardon him, and hell gnaw his bones. Why should he call her whore? Who keeps her company? What place, what time, what form, what likelihood? The Moors abused by some most villainous knave. Some base, notorious knave, some scurvy fellow, O oh, heaven, that such companions thou wouldst unfold and put in every honest hand a whip to lash the rascals naked through the world, even from the east to the west. Speak within door. No fie upon them. Some such squire he was that turned your wit the seamy side without and made you to suspect me with the more. You are a fool. Go to. Oh, good Iago. What shall I do to win my lord again? Good friend, go to him, for by this light of heaven I know not how I lost him. Here I kneel, if ever my will did trespass against his love, either in discourse of thought or actual deed, or that mine eyes, mine ears, or any sense delighted them in any other form, or that I do not yet, and ever did, and ever will, though he do shake me off to beggarly divorcement. Love him dearly. Comfort or spare me. Unkindness may do much, and his unkindness may defeat my life, but never take my love. I cannot say a whore. It does abhor me now, I speak the word. To do the act that might the addition earn, not the world's mass of vanity could make me. I pray you, be content. Tis but his humor. The business of the state does him offense, and he does chide with you. If it were no other. Tis but so, I warrant. Trumpets within. Hark how these instruments summon to supper. The messengers of Venice stay the meat. Go in and weep not. All things shall be well. Exeunt Desdemona and Amelia. Enter Rodrigo. 
How now, Roderigo? I do not find that thou dealest justly with me. What in the contrary? Every day thou daffest me with some device, Iago, and rather as it seems to me now, keepest from me all conveniency that supplies me with the least advantage of hope. I will indeed no longer endure it, nor am I yet persuaded to put up in peace that already I have foolishly suffered. Will you hear me, Rodrigo? Faith, I have heard too much, for your words and performances are no kin together. You charge me most unjustly. With naught but truth, I have wasted myself out of my means. The jewels you have had from me to deliver to Desdemona would half have corrupted a votarist. You have told me she hath received them and returned me expectations and comforts of sudden respect and acquaintance. But I find none. Well, go to very well. Very well, I go to. I cannot go to, man. Nor tis not very well. Nay, I think it scurvy and begin to find myself phobed in it. Very well. I tell you, tis not very well. I will make myself known to Desdemona. If she will return me, me my jewels, I will give over my suit and repent my unlawful solicitation. If not, assure yourself, I will seek satisfaction in you. You have said now. I and said nothing but what I protest and in intendement doing. Why now I see there's metal in thee, and even from this instant to build on thee a better opinion than ever before. Give me thy hand, Rodrigo. Thou hast taken against me a most just exception, but yet I protest I have dealt most directly in thy affair. It hath not appeared. I grant indeed it hath not appeared, and your suspicion is not without wit and judgment, but Rodrigo, if thou hast that in thee indeed, which I have greater reason to believe now than ever, I mean purpose, courage, and valor this night, show it. If thou the next night following enjoy not Desdemona, take me from this world with treachery and devise engines for my life. Well, what is it? Is it within reason and compass? Sir, there is a special commission come from Venice to depute Cassio in Othello's place. Is that true? <laughs> Why then Othello and Desdemona return again to Venice? Oh no. He goes into Mauritania and takes away with him the fair Desdemona, unless his abode be lingered here by some accident, wherein none can be so determinate as the removing of Cassio. How do you mean removing of him? Why, by making him incapable of Othello's place, knocking out his brains. And that you would have me do. Aye, if you dare do yourself a profit and a right. He sups tonight with a harlotry, and thither will I go to him. He knows not yet of his horrible fortune. If you will watch his going thence, which I will fashion to fall out between twelve and one, you may take him at your pleasure. I will be near to second your attempt, and he shall fall between us. Come, stand not amazed at it, but go along with me. I will show you such a necessity in his death that you shall think yourself bound to put it on him. It is now high supper time and the night grows to waste. Above. I will hear further reason of this. And you shall be satisfied. Exeunt. Act four, scene three. Another room in the castle. Enter Othello, Lodovico, Desdemona, Amelia, and attendants. I do beseech you, sir. Trouble yourself no further. Uh. Pardon me, twill do me good to walk. Madam, good night. I humbly thank your ladyship. Your honor is most welcome. Will you walk, sir? Ah, oh, Desdemona. Lord. Get you to bed on the instant. I will be returned forthwith. Dismiss your attendant there. Look it be done. I will, my lord. Exeunt Othello, Lodovico, and attendants. How goes it now? He looks gentler than he did. He says he will return incontinent. He hath commanded me to go to bed and bade me to dismiss you. Dismiss me? It was his bidding. Therefore, good Amelia, give me my knightly wearing and adieu. We must not now displease him. I would you had never seen him. 
So would not I. My love does so approve him that even his stubbornness, his checks, his frowns, prithee unpin me, have grace and favor in them. I have laid those sheets you bade me on the bed. All's one. Good faith. How foolish are our minds. If I do die before thee, prithee, shroud me in one of those same sheets. Come, come, you talk. My mother had a maid called Barbara. She was in love. And he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of willow, an old thing twas, but it expressed her fortune, and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. Oh, I have much to do, but to go hang my head all at one side and sing it like poor Barbara. Prithee, dispatch. Shall I go fetch your nightgown? No, and pin me here. This little Vico is a proper man. A very handsome man. He speaks well. I know a lady in Venice would have walked barefoot to Palestine for a touch of his nether lip. Singing. The poor soul sat sighing by a sycamore tree. Sing all a green willow. Her hand on her bosom, her head on her knee. Sing willow, willow, willow. The fresh streams ran by her and murmured her moans. Sing willow, willow, willow. Her salt tears fell from her and softened the stones. Singing. Willow, willow, willow. Prithee, hide thee. Come. He'll come anon. Singing. Sing all the green willow must be my garland. Let nobody blame him, his scorn I approve. Nay, that's not this. Hark, who is that knocks? It's the wind singing. I called my love false love. But what said he then? Willow, willow, willow. If I caught more women, you'll couch with more men. So, get thee gone. Right. Eight eyes to it. Tis, tis neither here nor there. I've heard it said so. Ah, oh, these men, these men! Dost thou in conscience think, tell me, Amelia, that there be women to abuse their husbands in such gross kind? There be some such, no question. Didst thou do such a deed for all the world. Why would not you? No, by this heavenly light. Nor I neither by this heavenly light. I might do it as well in the dark. Didst thou do such a deed for all the world? Oh, the world's a huge thing. It is a great price for a small vice. No, I think thou wouldst not. In troth, I think I should. And undo it when I had done. Mary, I would not do such a thing for a joint ring, nor for measures of lawn, nor for gowns, petticoats, nor caps, nor any petty exhibition, but for the whole world. Why? Who would not make her husband a cuckold to make him a monarch? I should venture purgatory for it. Shrew me. I would do such a wrong for the whole world. Why, the wrong is but a wrong in the world, and having the world for your labor, tis a wrong in your own world, and you might quickly make it right. I do not think there is any such woman. Yes, a dozen, and as many to the vantage as would store the world they played for. But I, I do think it is their husbands' faults if wives do fall. Say that they slack their duties and pour our treasures into foreign laps or else break out in peevish jealousies, throwing restraint upon us, or say they strike us. 
or scant our former having and despite why we have goals. And though we have some grace, yet have we some revenge. Let husbands know their wives have sense like them. They see and, and smell and have their palates both for sweet and sour as husbands have. What is it that they do when they change us for others? Is it sport? I think it is. And doth aff affection breed it? I, I think it doth. Is it frailty that thus errs? It is so too. And have not we affections, desires for sport and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well, else let them know the ills we do, their ills instruct us so. Good night, good night. Heaven me such uses send, not to pick bad from bad, but by bad mend. Exeunt. Act five, scene one, Cyprus Street. Enter Iago and Rodrigo. Here, stand behind this bulk. Straight will he come. Wear thy good rapier bear and put it home. Quick, quick, fear nothing. I'll be at thy elbow. It makes us or it mars us. Think on that and fix most firm thy resolution. Bear it at hand. I may miscarry in it. Here at thy hand. Be bold and take thy stand. Retires. I have no great devotion to the deed, and yet he hath given me satisfying reasons. He's but a man gone forth my sword. He dies. I have rubbed this young quat almost to the sense, and he grows angry. Now, whether he kill Cassio or Cassio him, or each to kill the other, every way makes my gain. Live Rodrigo? He calls me to a restitution large of gold and jewels that I bob from him as gifts to Desdemona. It must not be. If Cassio do remain, he hath a daily beauty in his life that makes me ugly. And besides, the moor may unfold me to him. There stand I in much peril. No, he must die. But so, I hear him coming. Enter Cassio. I know his gate. Tis he. Villain, thou diest! Makes a pass at Cassio. That thrust had been mine enemy indeed. But that my coat is better than thou knowest, I will make proof of thine. Draws and wounds Rodrigo. Oh. Oh, I am slain. Iago from behind wounds Cassio in the leg and exit. I, I am maimed for help. Help, ho! Murderer! False. Murderer. Enter Othello. The voice of Cassio. Iago keeps his word. Oh, Villain that I am. Is it even so? Oh, uh, help, ho, oh, light, a surgeon. Tis he, oh, brave Iago, honest and just, that has such noble sense of thy friend's wrong. Thou teachest me, minion, your dear lies dead, and your unblessed fate highs. Strumpet, I come. Forth of my heart, those charms thine eyes are blotted. Thy bed, lust stained, shall with lust's blood be spotted. What ho? No watch? No passage? Murderer! Murderer! There's some mischance. The cry is very direful. Uh, help! Hark! Oh, wretched villain! Two or three groan. It is a heavy night. These may be counterfeits. Let's think it unsafe to come into the cry without more help. Nobody come. But I shall bleed to death. Hark! Re-enter Iago with a light. Here's one comes in his shirt with light and weapons. Who's there? Whose noise is this that one's on murder? We do not know. Did you not hear a cry? Here! Here, for heaven's sake, help me! What's the matter? This is Othello's ancient, as I take it. The same indeed, a very valiant fellow. What are you here that cries so grievously? Iago! 
Oh, I am spoiled, undone by villains. Give me some help. Oh, me, Lieutenant, what villains have done this? I think that one of them is here about. I cannot make a, a way. Oh, treacherous villains. What are you there? Come in and give some help. To Lodovico and Gradial. No, oh, help me here. That's one of them. Oh, murderous slave, oh, villain. Stabs Radomigo. Damn Diago, oh, you inhuman dog. Kill men in the dark. Where be these bloody thieves? How silent is this town? Oh, murder, murder! What may you be? Are you of good or evil? As you shall prove us, praise us. Signor Ludovico. He, sir. I cry you, mercy. Here's Cassio hurt by villains. Cassio! How is brother? My leg is cut in two. Mary, heaven forbid. Light, gentlemen, I'll bind it with my shirt. Enter Bianca. What? Is the matter? Ho? Who's that cried? Who is that cried? <gasps> oh, my dear Cassio. My sweet Cassio. Oh, Cassio. Cassio. Oh, Cassio. noble strumpet Cassio. May you suspect who they should be that thus had many led you? No. I am to find you thus. I have been to seek you. Lend me a garter. So. Oh, for a chair to bear him easily hence. Alas, he faints. <gasps> No, Cassio! 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 Gentlemen, all I do suspect this trash to be a party in this injury. Patience a while, good Cassio. Come, come, lend me a light. Know we this face or no? Alas, my friend and my dear countryman, Roderigo. No, yes, sure. Oh, heaven, Roderigo! What? A Venice? Even he, sir. Did you know him? Know him, I. Signor Gratiano, I cry you gentle pardon. These bloody accidents must excuse my manners that so neglected you. I'm glad to see you. How do you, Cassio? Oh, a chair, a chair! Rodrigo! He, he, tis he. A chair brought in. Oh, that's well said, the chair. Some good man, bear him carefully from hence. I'll fetch the general surgeon. To Bianca. For you, mistress, save your labor. Save you your labor. He that lies slain here, Cassio, was my dear friend. What malice was between you? None in the world, nor do I know the man. To Bianca. What? Look, you pale. Oh, bear him out of the air. Cassio and Rodrigo are borne off. Stay you, good gentlemen. Look, you pale, mistress. You perceive the ghastness of her eye. Nay, if you stare, we shall hear more anon. They hold her well. I pray you look upon her. Do you see, gentlemen? Nay, guiltiness will speak, though tongues were out of use. Enter Amelia. Lass, what's the matter? What's the matter, husband? Cassio hath here been set on in the dark by Rodrigo and fellows that are escaped. He's almost slain and Rodrigo dead. Alas, good gentleman. Alas, good Cassio. This is the fruit of whoring. Pretty Amelia, go know of Cassio where he's sucked tonight. To Bianca. What, do you shake at that? He supped at my house, but I therefore shake not. Oh, did he so? I charge you, go with me. Fie, fie upon thee, strumpet. I am no strumpet, but of life as honest as you that thus abuse me. As I, <laughs> fie upon thee. Kind gentlemen, let's go see poor Cassio dressed. Come, mistress, you must tell us another tale. Amelia, run you to the citadel and tell my lord and lady what hath happened. Will you go on, I pray? Aside. This is the night that either makes me or fordoes me quite. Exeunt. Act five, scene two, a bedchamber in the castle, Desdemona in bed asleep, a light burning, enter Othello. It is the cause, it is the cause of my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chaste stars. It is the cause, yet, I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. Yet she must die, else she'll betray more men. Put out the light. 
and they put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore. Should I repent me, but once put out thy light, thou cunningest pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume. When I have plucked the rose, I cannot give it vital growth again. It must needs wither. I'll smell it on a tree. Kissing her. <gasps> Balmy breath that dost almost persuade justice to break her sword. One more. One more. Be thus when thou art dead and I will kill thee and love thee after. One more and this the last. So sweet was ne'er so fatal, I must weep, but they are cruel tears. This sorrow's heavenly, it strikes where it doth love. She wakes. Who's there? A fellow? I, Desdemona. Will you come to bed, my lord? Have you prayed tonight? Desdemona. Aye, my lord. If you bethink yourself of any crime, unreconciled yet to heaven and grace, solicit for it straight. Alas, my lord, what do you mean by that? Well, do it and be brief. I will walk by. I would not kill thy unprepared spirit. No, heaven forfend, I would not kill thy soul. Talk you of killing? I, I do. And heaven have mercy on me. Amen, with all my heart. If you say so, I hope you will not kill me. Go on. And yet I fear you. <laughs> you well then when your eyes roll so. <laughs> Why I should fear I not know, since guiltiness I know not. Yet I feel fear. Think on thy sins. They are loves I bear to you. Aye, and for that thou diest. That death's unnatural that kills for loving. <laughs> Why not you sew your nether lip? Some bloody passion shakes your very frame. These are portents, but yet I hope, I hope, you not, do not point on me. Peace and be still. I will so. What's the matter? That handkerchief which I so loved and gave thee, thou gavest to Cassio. No! By my life and soul, send for the man and ask him. Sweet soul, take heed. Take heed of perjury. Thou art on thy deathbed. Aye, but not yet to die. Yes, presently. Therefore confess thee freely of thy sin, for to deny each article with oath cannot remove nor choke the strong conception that I do groan with all. Thou art to die. Lord, have mercy on me. I say amen. And have you mercy too? I never did offend you in my life, never loved Cassio, but with such general warranty of heaven as I might love. I never gave him token. By heaven, I saw my handkerchief's in's hand. Oh, perjured woman, thou dost stone my heart and makest me call what I intend to do a murder, which I thought a sacrifice. I saw the handkerchief. He found it then. I never gave it him. Send for him hither, let him confess a truth. He hath confessed. What, my lord? That he hath used thee. How? Unlawfully? I. He will not say so. No, his mouth is stopped. Honest Iago hath taken order for it. Oh, my fear interprets. What, is he dead? Had all his hairs been lives, my great revenge had stomach for them all. Alas, he 
is betrayed and I am done. Out, strumpet, weeps thou for him to my face. Oh, banish me, my lord, but kill me not. Oh, down, strumpet. Kill me tomorrow. Let me live tonight. Nay, if you strive. But have an hour. Being done, there is no pause. But while I say one prayer. It is too late. He stifles her within. My lord, my lord, what ho, my lord, my lord. What noise is this? Not dead, not yet quite dead. I that am cruel am yet merciful. I would not have thee linger in thy pain. So, so. Within. What ho, my lord, my lord. Who's there? Within. Oh, good, my lord, I would speak a word with you. Uh, yes, tis Amelia. By and by, she's dead. Tis like she comes to speak of Cassio's death. The noise was here. Ha! Ah, no more moving. Still, as the grave. Shall she come in? What good? I think she stirs again. No. What's best to do? If she come in, she'll sure speak to my wife. My wife. My wife. What wife? I have no wife. Ah, insupportable, a ah, heavy hour. Methinks it should be now a huge eclipse of sun and moon, and that the affrighted globe should yawn at alteration. Within. I do beseech you that I may speak with you. Oh, good, my lord. Oh, I have forgot thee. Oh, come in, Emilia. Soft. By and by, let me draw the curtains. Where art thou? Unlocks the door and to Amelia. Uh, what's the matter with thee now? Oh my good Lord, yonder's foul murder's done. What now? But now, my Lord. It is the very error of the moon. She comes more near earth than she was wont and makes men mad. Cassio, my lord, hath killed a young Venetian called Rodrigo. Rodrigo killed? And Cassio killed? No, Cassio is not killed. Oh, oh not Cassio killed, then murders out of tune and sweet revenge grows harsh. Falsely murdered. Alas, what cry is that? Uh, that what? Out. And alas, that was my lady's voice. Help, help, ho! Help, oh lady, speak again, sweet Desdemona. Oh, sweet mistress, speak. A guiltless death I die. Oh, who hath done this deed? Nobody. I myself. She dies. Why, how should she be murdered? Alas, who knows? Oh, you heard her say so herself. It was not I. She said so. I must needs report the truth. She lies like a liar gone to burning hell. Twas I that killed her. Oh, the more angel she and you, the blacker devil. She turned to folly, and she was a whore. Thou dost belie her, and thou art a devil. She was false as water. Thou art rash as fire to say that she was false. Oh, she was heavenly true. Cassio did top her. Ask thy husband else. Oh, I were damned beneath all depth in hell, but that I did proceed upon just grounds to this extremity. Thy husband knew it all. My husband. Thy husband. That she was false to wedlock. I, with Cassio. Nay, had she been true, if heaven would make me such another world of one entire and perfect chrysalis, I'll not have sold her for it. My husband. Aye, 
Twas he that told me first. An honest man he is and hates the slime that sticks on filthy deeds. My husband. What needs this iteration, woman? I say thy husband. Oh, mistress. Villainy hath made mocks with love. My husband say that she was false. He, woman, I say thy husband. Dost understand the word? My friend, thy husband, honest, honest Iago. If you say so, may his pernicious soul rot half a grain a day. He lies to the heart. She was too fond of her most filthy bargain. Ha! <laughs> Do thy worst. This deed of thine is no more worthy heaven than thou wast worthy her. Peace. You were best. Thou hast not half the power to do me harm as I have to be hurt. O oh, gull, O oh, dolt as ignorant as dirt, thou hast done a deed. I care not for thy sword. I'll make thee known, though I lost twenty lives. Help, help, ho! Oh, help, the more hath killed my mistress. Murder, murder! Enter Montano, Gradiano, Iago, and others. What is the matter? How now, General? No, oh, are you come, Iago? You have done well that men must lay their murders on your neck. What is the matter? Disprove this villain, if thou beest a man. He says thou toldst him that his wife was false. I know thou didst not, thou art not such a villain. Speak, for my heart is full. I told him what I thought and told no more than what he found himself was apt and true. But did you ever tell him she was false? I did. You told a lie, an odious, damned lie upon my soul, a lie, a wicked lie, she false with Cassio. Did you say with Cassio? With Cassio, mistress, go to charm your tongue. I will not charm my tongue. I am bound to speak. My mistress here lies murdered in her bed. Oh, heavens forfend. And your reports have set the murder on. Nay, stare not, masters. It is true, indeed. Tis a strange truth. Oh, monstrous act. Villainy, villainy, villainy. I think upon it, I think. I smell it, oh, villainy. I thought so then, I'll kill myself for grief. Oh, villainy, villainy. What are you mad? I charge you, get you home. Good gentlemen, let me have leave to speak. Tis proper I obey him, but not now. Perchance, Iago, I will ne'er go home. <laughs> he falls in the bed. Nay, lay thee down and roar. For thou hast killed the sweetest innocent that e'er did lift up eye. Rising. She was foul. I scarce did know you, uncle. There lies your niece, whose breath indeed these hands have newly stopped. I know this act shows horrible and grim. Poor Desdemona, I am glad thy father's dead. Thy match was mortal to him, and pure grief shore his old thread in twain. Did he live now? His sight would make him do a desperate turn, yea, curse his better angel from his side and fall to reprobation. Tis pitiful, but yet Iago knows that she with Cassio hath the act of shame a thousand times committed. Cassio confessed it, and she did gratify his amorous works with that recognizance and pledge of love which I first gave her. I saw it in his hand. It was a handkerchief, an antique token my father gave my mother. Oh, heaven! Oh, heavenly powers! Come, hold your peace. Twill out, twill out, I, peace, no. I will speak as liberal as the North. Let heaven and men and devils, let them all, all, all cry shame against me, yet I will speak. Be wise and get you home. I will not. Iago offers to stab Milia. 
fie your sword upon a woman? Oh, thou dull more. That handkerchief thou speaks of I found by fortune and did give my husband. For often with a solemn earnestness more than indeed belonged to such a trifle, he begged of me to steal it. Villainous whore! He gave it Cassio. No, alas! I found it and I did give it my husband. Filth, thou liest! By heaven, I do not. I do not, gentlemen. O oh, murderous coxcomb, what should such a fool do with so good a woman? Are there no stones in heaven but what serve for the thunder? Precious villain! He runs at Iago. Iago, from behind, stabs Amelia. The Next. woman falls. Sure, he hath killed his wife. I, I, oh, lay me by my mistress' side. He's gone, but his wife killed. Tis a notorious villain. Take you this weapon, which I have recovered from the moor. Come, guard the door without. Let him not pass, but kill him, rather. I'll after that same villain, for tis a damned slave. Exit Montano and Gradiano. I am not a valiant neither, but ever puny wispster gets my sword. But why should honor outlive honesty? Let it go all. What did thy song bode, lady? Hark, canst thou hear me? I will play the swan and die in music. Singing. Willow, 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 more. She was chaste. She loved thee, cruel more. So come my soul to bliss as I speak true. So speaking as I think, I die, I die. She dies. I have another weapon in this chamber. It is a sword of Spain, the Icebrook's temper. Oh, here it is. Uncle, I must come forth. If thou What's attempt that? it, it will cost thee dear. Thou hast no weapon and perforce must suffer. Look in upon me then and speak with me, or naked as I am, I will assault thee. Reintegrate, Anna. What is the matter? Behold, I have a weapon. A better never did itself sustain upon a soldier's thigh. I have seen the day that with this little arm and this good sword, I have made my way through more impediments than 20 times your stop. But uh, they boast. Who can control his fate? Tis not so now. Be not afraid, though you do see me weaponed. Here is my journey's end. Here is my butt and my very sea mark of my utmost sail. Do you go back dismayed? Tis a lost fear, man, but a rush against a fellow's breast, and he retires. Where should a fellow go? Now, how dost thou look now, O oh, ill-starred wench? Pale as thy smock, when we shall meet at Compt, this look of thine will hurl my soul from heaven, and fiends will snatch at it. Cold, cold, my girl, even like thy chastity. Cursed slave! Whip me, devil, from thy possession of this heavenly sight. Blow me about in winds, roast me in sulfur, wash me in steep down gulfs of liquid fire. Oh, Desdemona, Desdemona, dead. Oh, oh, oh. Enter Lodovico, Montano, Cassio, carried in a chair, and officers with Iago, a prisoner. Where is this rash and most unfortunate man? 
that he that was a fellow here I am. Where is that viper? Bring the villain forth. I look down towards his feet, but that's a fable. If that thou best a devil, I cannot kill thee. Wounds Iago. Wrench his sword from him. I bleed, sir, but I'm not killed. I am not sorry, neither. I'll have thee live, for in my sense, tis happiness to die. Oh, thou art fellow. Thou wert once so good, fallen in the practice of a damned slave. What shall be said to thee? Why, anything. An honorable murderer, if you will, for naught I did in hate, but all in honor. This wretch hath part confessed his villainy. Did you and he consent in Cassio's death? I... General, I never gave you cause. I do believe it, and I ask your pardon. Will you, I pray, demand that demi-devil why he hath thus ensnared my soul and body? Demand me nothing. What you know, you know. From this time forth, I never will speak a word. What? Not to pray. Torments will ope your lips. Well, thou dost best. Sir, you shall understand what hath befallen, which, as I think, you know not. Here is a letter found in the pocket of the slain Rodrigo, and here another. The one of them imports the death of Cassio to be undertook by Rodrigo. Oh, villain. Most heathenish and most gross. Now here's another discontented paper found in his pocket too. And this it seems Rodrigo meant to have sent this damned villain. But that be like Iago in the interim came in and satisfied him. Oh, the pernicious caitiff! How came you, Cassio, by that handkerchief that was my wife's? Found it in my chamber, and he himself confessed but even now that there he dropped it for a special purpose which wrought to his desire. Oh, fool, fool, fool! There is besides in Rodrigo's letter how he upbraids Iago, that he made him brave me upon the watch, whereon it came that I was cast, and even but now he spake. After long seeming dead, Iago hurt him. Iago set him on. You must forsake this room and go with us. Your power and your command is taken off, and Cassio rules in Cyprus. For this slave, if there be any cunning cruelty that can torment him much and hold him long, it shall be his. You shall close prisoner rest, till that the nature of your fault be known to the Venetian state. Come, bring him away. Soft you, a word or two before you go. I have done the state some service, and they note no more of that. I pray you, in your letters, when you shall these unlucky deeds relate, speak of me as I am. Nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice. Then must you speak of one that loved, not wisely, but too well. Of one not easily jealous, but being wrought, perplexed in the extreme of one whose hand, like the based Indian, threw a pearl away richer than all his tribe, of one whose subdued eyes, albeit unused to the melting mood, drop tears as fast as the Arabian trees, their medicinal gum. Set you down this and say, besides, that in Aleppo once, where a malignant and a turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the state, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. He stabs himself. Bloody period. 
All that spoke is marred. I kissed thee ere I killed thee. No way but this, killing myself to die upon a kiss. Falls on the bed and dies. This I did fear, but thought he had no weapon, for he was great of heart. To Iago. Spartan dog, more fell than anguish, hunger, or the sea. Look on the tragic loading of this bed. This is thy work. The object poisoned sight. Let it be hid. Graciano, keep the house and seize upon the fortunes of the moor, for they succeed on you. To you, Lord Governor, remains the center of this hellish villain. The time, the place, the torture, though enforce it. Myself will straight aboard, and to the state this heavy act with heavy heart relate. Exeunt. And that concludes our online presentation of Othello. Thank you for watching. Good night.